be with you all here tonight. I'm Lynn Benander with the Cooperative Development Institute. Shaku al Juani, and I'm also with the Cooperative Development Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been doing cooperative development for about 10 years, looking at how communities can build uh, resources within, the, within their communities that um, add value, that stay in the community, that don't walk off when another good opportunity comes along. And um, we've had a great time preparing this um, syllabus that from the conversation that we had on the phone about the things that you were most interested in learning about. And tonight's um, workshop is going to be on um, strategic planning, really thinking through a business idea, looking at what it is um, before you and whether or not it might be feasible, um, looking at um, what, the, what the opportunities are in a community so that you can assess them and figure out what things to go forward with and what things to walk away from because um, it's not likely that it's going to be worth your time or the community folks' time to pursue them. And you know, particularly at this point, uh, uh, beginning to talk about alternatives to uh, big box development, to the wall marketization of, of, of our economy, I think it's an important question. Uh, you know, as we, one of the things we talk about in there, the communities all over the country are, are trying to fight back and, and for a number of different reasons, whether uh, around workers' issues, uh, um, uh, urban pl planning issues or um, small business support issues. But the question of what is the alternative? I mean, I've been a community organizer for 30-something 30, 30 years. You can win sometimes on a just say no kind of thing, but you can't win continually on that. You have to be able to talk about what are, what are you for? You know, what is your alternative to, 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 this, to this predatory um, um, beast that we face? And so that, that, that was, uh, it, it felt that this was a good way to not only begin to, to uh, 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 talk about this problem that we face in terms of the globalization and, 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 and some of these corporate players, but also begin to t start talking about the, uh, the, uh, the strengths and, po and, and positive experience of group-based business uh, development uh, of, of all types over, the la over quite a few years uh, happening in this country and around the world. And, and beginning to you know, talk more about how can we uh, learn from the experiences, develop the kind of tools and skills we need so that we can begin to really add a whole new weapon in our, you know, to our, our, our artillery and a new tool in our toolbox that, that can really begin to help uh, build uh, sustainable communities. So, uh, so we've got, we've, um, today's session is on this um, overview and planning. Tomorrow we're going to be doing business planning and the legal and accounting structures that support group-based group businesses. Um, following it, two weeks from today, we're going to look at uh, membership issues and um, how you support uh, governance so that a group of people can retain ownership and control over their business. And the following day, on Tuesday, we're going to look at how, you, how do you sustain these businesses. Once you get them up and running, if you don't have the infrastructure for keeping them focused on their mission and, and successful, all of the development effort really was for naught. So um, how, what, how could we sustain these businesses is that last day. And um, before we get started on our presentation, I'm just wondering if people would be willing to go around and um, talk just for a minute about what it is that you've done in terms of group-based business development to secure assets and communities that you've worked in. Done a lot. I think that, I think it's it's a good question the way you framed it because I think I've done a lot of community-based work. I've worked for programs and CDCs and different partnership projects and organizing. But I think that I feel like I haven't spent a lot of time looking at this issue specifically on how do you leverage assets, keep them in the community, run businesses. Um, so I feel like I really haven't spent a lot of time on that. But um, I've done a lot of youth work. Um, sort of participatory planning work, um, university community partnership work, um, and, and some of that has led to conversations about how do we support microenterprise, how do we mm -hmm. you know, create a fund that people can draw from, whether it's a credit union or um, you know, how does the university set up a, a, a loan situation that communities can draw from to do community development, to even do partnership projects um, with universities, so how do they how do they create pools of money that they can support the communities to work 
with the universities in that way and educate their students the way they're doing on a daily basis. So, um, but I feel like they haven't led very far. Those are all pretty directly related to the topic, though. <laughs> yeah, so I've, I've been thinking about it, but I'm excited about the, the workshop, too, to kind of get down in it. And I'm hoping from this point forward that I have more specific mm -hmm. tools to kind of pick up on those ideas and say, OK, yeah, how do we, how do, we do this? Like, I think that a lot of that knowledge is, is not really there. Um, do you want to talk about one thing that you've worked on? You've done a lot of support for group-based business, a lot of infrastructure support work. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Just in terms of developing programs that, that supported them. And, you know, at the policy level, you've done work that supported that. All right, I'm yeah, making it up. Good. I made it all yeah. up. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> um, I guess in public housing, when I worked in public housing mm -hmm. in New York, one of the things we did was we uh, we had an amnesty period for all of the residents of public housing that actually had businesses because it was illegal, you weren't supposed to. Mm -hmm. And we had an amnesty, and uh, we found out that, well, at least more than 250 mm -hmm. businesses like um, applied. They, we said if you apply, you can become legal. And we, we discovered more than 250 businesses. Uh, most, you know, most of them were group businesses in one form or another. And then we offered um, housing contracts, uh, contracts with the housing authority to those businesses, guaranteed if they completed a 10-week uh, training program. And um, many did, and they got contracts. Um, so that was one. But I, you know, I'm a, son of a preacher of a pretty big church, and I felt like that was like a business. Mm -hmm. Because you were definitely <laughs> collecting money, you were definitely spending money. You had to keep the books. You got to keep the cash flowing. You know, it, was a, it really was, uh, you know, like yeah. I thought it was like a business. Yeah. Um, My name is Mariana levy Spironis, and I work at Lawrence Community Works, which is the CDC in Lawrence. And um, personally, I've been in a co-op in college, um, but this is my first time trying to brainstorm how to put one together. And so we have we have a membership of about a thousand people, and we're trying to figure out how to leverage the power of that network for some sort of collective economic benefit. Um, we don't really know where to start, so that's why I'm here. And uh, my name is Kalil Shahid, and uh, I've worked uh, with a couple group businesses slash co-ops, uh, mostly in some kind of way dealing with agriculture. Uh, there's one uh, in New Orleans, uh, it, was, it was an urban project, but uh, we used from a housing project. We had a couple of uh, community gardens, and um, you know they grew many things, but their main uh, crop was uh, peppers. They grew seven varieties of hot peppers, and they actually created their own uh, a recipe for hot sauce, and Louisiana is famous for hot sauce, so it was you know it was fitting, and they called it St. Thomas Hot Sauce, and designed their own little label, and were trying to get funding and investors to actually be able to market it. Uh, when I left, and um, I worked in uh, Alabama with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, and mm -hmm. worked with uh, I was the director of the youth program there, and did some cooperative work with uh, community-based, I mean community-supported agriculture product projects. Okay. Do you want to talk about one or two of the things you've been connected to? <laughs> well, I've uh, been doing community organizing in um, Buffalo, um, uh, New York City, and then uh, Florida, and other uh, Chicago, and other places. I came out of the steel industry. I was worked. Uh, I was a steel worker for almost ten years and was very active uh, working around minority and, and steel worker issues, uh, uh, union issues. Uh, um, in the process, we always did uh, our community work. Our approach had, back those days, and we, we used to, I was a member of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, we used to say, from the plant to the community, from the community to the plant, there was, there was no difference to us, you know, so it was a, a common thing. And we, one of the things that we did uh, um, was, was um, cooperative projects, so we had, I've uh, done uh, uh, a food co-ops, uh, fuel co-ops, um, credit unions, um, um, you know, and now at this point, I'm working with a, um, um, with um, projects in, in, particularly in Buffalo, where we're one of them is a uh, young people that are trying to do a hot sauce. Like that. <laughs> so we have to talk about that. But then also, uh, um, um, uh, with community land trusts, and <laughs> yeah, right. 
uh, and, and uh, uh, other forms of urban agriculture and, uh, um, and then uh, as well as uh, looking at, we're, we're also talking about an urban rural project with the, uh, where we're talking about trying to use the, uh, the Mondragon example. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so instead of just doing ones and twos, uh, kind of, of uh, cooperatives, mm -hmm. bringing, uh, setting up networks of cooperatives that, 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 that uh, work together um, linking urban and rural areas uh, to together, and so we're at this point we're in the, in the um, fundraising stage and and and, uh, and um, development stage of it. And, and uh, but, but our hope is to begin to in in Western New York and Western Mass to to begin to develop some Mondragon style uh, um, uh, cooperatives and uh, set some linking their inner cities to the uh, rural areas. So, yeah. And. Um, for the last 10 years, I've been working on about 40 projects a year, with four of them being you know, my primary responsibility each year, and mostly in sustainable agriculture and sustainable energy. And um, right now, I'm working with the Low Income Housing Co-op, um, a biodiesel production facility, um, a, an energy co a consumer energy cooperative that's looking to build renewable energy resources and conservation efficiency in both low income communities to reduce the energy that they're using in their energy bills and, um, uh, and in uh, surrounding communities that really are interested in building um, renewable energy resources and also sharing that resource with the low-income communities nearby. Um, and another one too, but I've, it's escaped me. Oh, an herb processing facility. Um, with some farmers, um, and if they see this, I'm sorry, I forgot for a minute. But, um, uh, and that's pretty fun. So those are the things on my plate at the moment. Um, and I try in my work to, um, to do both urban and rural together, as Shakur was saying, because I, I feel like there's so many resources that are um, uh, of mutual need. The folks in the rural areas need things in, uh, that people in the urban areas have and vice versa. And so a lot of synergy and um, not isolating groups and bringing people together. So pretty fun. And with that. The drums will roll, and we have our presentation, which yeah. we've been working on for you, which we're pretty excited about. Yeah, because as, as I said, um, the, uh, the need is great now. I mean, uh, the, we're, we're talking uh, um, uh, urban and rural communities are going through incredible strains and stresses uh, 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 from massive job loss, like I said, from places like Buffalo, I mean, where they, you know, the, uh, the entire city is almost uh, emptied out. I mean, uh, we're, uh, from going from 600,000 and, um, and s at places like Steel Plant, where I used to first work, there was 21,000 people working there. Now it's uh, maybe 100, you know, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, a city that went from 600,000 to about 250. I mean, so they, uh, and that's the kind of things that are happening all over, you know, in, 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 uh, in Rust Belt kind of areas. And, um, the disinvestment, the lack of affordable housing, the, you know, the, um, uh, and so the, the idea of how do we begin to, to, to uh, forge some new, uh, um, new methods of, of, of attacking these problems, how do we begin to, to, to bring people together? There's all kinds of organizing going on, but, but uh, the question of how we can begin to actually do uh, job creation, actually begin to, to create um, um, new kinds of opportunities. Um, that the, the um, mechanisms have not been there and, and the traditional approaches haven't been working. Um, it's moving by itself. Do you know why? <laughs> uh, nope. Let me see. Well, let's try this one. Okay, yeah. So, um, it's probably on the timer if it's on the PowerPoint. It shouldn't be. It, yeah. We didn't put it on a timer. Yeah. Oh no, it's going by itself. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay, but so uh, like I said, uh, the the urban and rural areas, they uh, finding uh, um, uh, sources of investment uh, extremely difficult. Uh, whether you're in an inner city or a rural area, trying to uh, education and job training of uh, educational system in most of the cities around the country are, have completely uh, um, imploded, and then the, as, and the rural areas have have, have never <laughs> really even stepped up to the, seriously up to the plate. Dig digital divide again. Those are the, uh, the areas that are most uh, left out of the uh, of, out of the information age. Uh, the rural and uh, seniors and, and and the folks of color and you know in inner cities, and and also just few opportunities to to really participate and, and be involved. Uh, uh, and 
and, uh, and, 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 and processes where they can make a, a, a decisive voice in what their community looks like and, and, and what kind of services and, and, and uh, uh, um, inf infrastructures are set up uh, inside of their communities. Did it go more than one? <laughs> mm. We have just a small yeah. hand again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Few yeah. developments. I'm having a hard time to figure out how to position here. It's pretty big to read upside yeah. down there. Okay. So um, we have what we call, we've named the box store bust, which is step one. A box store says, we promise that we're going to bring great local economic be benefit to you. Step two is the box store opens and um, the d soaks up a whole lot of development funds and tax rebates and uh, charges low prices because, well, they're not paying their folks very much and they're not paying the employees of their suppliers very much so they can charge their low wages and consumers save money. It's very exciting. Step three in the box store bust is local businesses shut down. People are out of work. Consumers um, with are um, left without expert personal service that they've come to know and without products that are tailored to their needs that the local businesses used to carry for them. Step four is the box store closes down because they've got some more profits promised somewhere else and all the jobs are lost, all the public investment is lost, consumers have no access to those products or services, and they get to save some more money because they're not buying, no. <laughs> they actually, in step five, they get to pay more money because they've got to drive farther to get those things. Um, the community pays for uninsured health benefits and unemployment costs, um, and uh, the local economy loses the multiplier effect of all of those resources. And we've seen it in the pharmaceutical industry, we've seen it in, in hardware stores, we've seen it in clothing stores, and this, for some reason, it's still a preferred economic development model um, in most municipalities across the country. And, we're left scratching our heads and saying, well, you know, every time we get to talk with somebody from one of these municipalities about the alternatives, they say, oh, we didn't know there were any. We would love to know. So Shakur and I are very excited about, and many and many other people, very excited about trying to figure out how to really show people that these other alternatives exist and have existed for a long time here in this country and around the world. This isn't new. This is just going back to some of the things that um, cultures have known for, for centuries about how you build real economic wealth in your community. And as we've said, I mean, the, the, the worst of, uh, of, of all the, these uh, players has been Walmart, that they've uh, that set up, you know, that, and not, not only, <coughs> only screwing up a job and, and pay standards in, 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 uh, in, in this country, it's, it's having an effect on the entire world. Um, it, you know, uh, one of the largest corporations in the world, 1.2 million workers, then. Um, Few with uh, most with low pay, most with uh, um, no employment, uh, employer health coverage, in, in spite of the uh, the many uh, commercials that you will see that will, talk, you know, talk to the op, uh, to the contrary, and it, that it drives its uh, suppliers uh, to, to search the world for cheaper labor. I mean, and so that not only does it have an impact on on the, that immediate group of folks, that it, it spans out. And so whether you're a toy supplier or a food supplier or or whatever. I mean, uh, that, that you're all forced to, to, to dance to, to Walmart's uh, beat. And uh, like I said, if it was the country, it'd be the fifth largest importer, and it's particularly uh, um, the particular relations it's set up with uh, China, in spite of all the conversation that um, talking about democracy and other things. Um, that it's that they're being cited um, by other folks uh, uh, by as the cutting play health care, the impact they had on the entire um, uh, California um, supermarket structure, Safeway, Kroger, you know, the, the list goes on and on, Kmart, uh, uh, True Value, I mean, um, the store, stores that are, are either going out of business or are, are reeling from the competition, uh, uh, you know, it's a, a very long list and, and the question is what are we going to be left with? One big huge uh, uh, corporation that then, that then can, um, you know, set up a, a pattern that, that uh, that will dev you know that is devastating uh, the the living standards of American workers. Um, you know, as I said, it's leading the global and domestic co corporate uh, race to the bottom. Uh, poor wa poverty wages, poor benefits, and the harassment. You know, you, some of you might have heard uh, you know how they lock their workers in, in overnight um, in, uh, in order to stop a uh, spoilage theft. You know, uh, 
you know, so then, uh, you know, people were not able to get out for emergency reasons and other things. I mean, function like a, a com concentration camp. <clears throat> and it's a, a battle. I mean, that one of the things, uh, you know, there's been some talk. I mean, there's been a couple of big uh, um, uh, uh, victories against Walmart, uh, uh, the, the, the work of um, um, uh, Lon, uh, um, uh, Los Angeles uh, for, for, um, uh, uh, for an, uh, a new economy, <laughs> Los Angeles for a new economy, Madeline Janice uh, Apasio and, and those, you know, the beating them back there, the, 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 the defeat in uh, Chicago and just recently the defeat in uh, uh, Queens. Um, but there's even many more. I mean, this, we just got this from, from uh, Al Norman. I mean, uh, and this was just over the last two, uh, two years that uh, um, just in New England, and, and when you look at around the country, it's a much longer list, but just uh, communities all over the place that have been uh, fighting them. Now, quite often, they come back again. I mean, some, you know, many times a, a, a community will beat them once, and then, but with the you know, reservoirs of capital and political power they have, then they come right back at you again. And, you know, and then maybe it might not be that successful. And so, but, but, but one of the things that we need to get a sense of is that, th that there is a, a movement that's developing that brings together all kinds of sectors, labor, uh, folks that are concerned about uh, just good uh, uh, public planning, uh, you know, um, folks that want to see small, small businesses and other things, uh, um, um, uh, uh, women's uh, uh, groups, um, and since the uh, lawsuits that have been done is showing that, that that Walmart uh, discriminates against women, that, women, that there's a glass ceiling that's very low that stops them from uh, moving up and, uh, uh, um, and uh, you know, into the corporate and uh, corporate power, the, um, uh, uh, the abuses against um, uh, minority workers, particularly um, uh, against uh, immigrant workers. So it's, it's uh, many different folks, and, and, these, and it's going across the board, not only just Walmart, it's against people fighting against Home Depot, against, uh, you know, all the different uh, um, um, big box uh, uh, stores that are coming in and, and rampaging their, their communities. <clears throat> I'm going to say, I mean, uh, you know, part of this also is the, you know, as uh, Lynn was saying before, is, is a recognition that, that the uh, traditional economic approaches, uh, development approaches, have, have, have not worked in our inner cities and rural areas. That if, if we go by the, the proof in, is in the pudding, uh, you know, that, that uh, um, large amounts of money is being brought forth. Uh, you know, in fact, Greg Leroy uh, says that uh, there's something like $50 billion a year in, in state and, uh, um, and uh, uh, municipal uh, monies that go toward uh, uh, development. And, and uh, often, like I said, it, it's uh, justified with anti-poverty uh, record uh, rhetoric. It's often uh, based on uh, poverty stats. Uh, but then the, the monies go elsewhere, uh, uh, you know, and, and, the, and you know, uh, in, in place like in Buffalo, for example, uh, you know, just one um, urban planning fiasco after, after another, one using a, a CBDG money to, to, to uh, uh, buy off floors of, uh, of patronage workers that don't do urban planning, to, to, uh, to giving the money away to folks like uh, the Adelphia uh, thugs, uh, you know, the Regas family who was supposed to uh, uh, redevelop the waterfront, uh, or the, the, to, to stadiums, to ca uh, and the next one now is uh, is, is casinos, and uh, you know adding a, a whole new problem that's not you know creating a handful of jobs and create and then creating gambling uh, dependencies. And there's and there's something <coughs> odd about <coughs> the ethic around these funds. Uh, there are many programs that these funds are administered through where there isn't even preference given to ways of spending that money that retains ownership in the public sphere. Not only there isn't a preference, but lots of times those programs don't even allow. You have to be a private developer, you know, to access those funds. So what, what's, what's missing about our ethic, about how those funds are, re, are invested in our communities, and why isn't, that they're pre, why isn't their preference given for the kinds of group-based, locally-owned initiatives that we're going to be talking about tonight in all of the programs throughout all of the agencies of federal and state local government. Mm -hmm. As uh, um, the uh, Director General of the World Health, Health Organization is saying that this is the, the, the challenge of the 21st century. Can we build sustainable communities? Um, uh, uh, com uh, and, and whether or not we can begin to bring together the uh, um, the, the 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 mix of, of forces from uh, political to, to vision to to to, to uh, uh, financial to and other you know technical assistance and other to, to be able to make uh, true sustainable communities happen is is, is the question uh, uh, you know f for this uh, uh, this century you know so if 
if, if not box is big box approach is not the right way, then what are the kinds of alternatives that we can begin to look at? How, how can we begin to, to redevelop uh, communities that are, are struggling to survive? Uh, uh, if, and, and we'd like to throw that out and just have, first have a little conversation on it. What, what things that either you've seen in your experience or that uh, you've thought about that, that might be ways of, how to, of attacking some of those uh, need, uh, you know, serious uh, uh, issues that, that are, are, are happening in, in, uh, in urban and rural areas. Uh, um, how do we begin to construct some new alternative uh, approaches? So if box mm. stores are no, what's mm. yes? <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, difficult um, in the sense that, you know, that there's so many different ways um, to approach it. Uh, you know, uh, from a microeconomic or macroeconomic you know, perspective, you know, it just depends on, on how you want to approach it. Um, you know, obviously, you know, while we're here, you know, cooperatives, uh, um, you know, small-scale community-based industries are an alternative, but how do you do that, you know, with the, the uh, push and pull factor of, you know, scale and, 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 trying, and, and trying to get bigger? Um, you know, uh, we just spent a week down in Mississippi just looking at uh, just different development models and things that were going on there. And, um, you know, a, a big problem, I think, you know, this, with the situation of, you know, these huge box uh, style of, of industries and corporations, I think, you know, plantation agriculture system is another box. It's just, you know, <laughs> a box on land. Mm. And I think, you know, it's, it's the same issue, you know, there where you see small farmers are just unable to compete, unable to survive because it's just such, just because, you know, the market is so skewed, the prices are so skewed, you know, the scale that you have to reach in order to survive is so skewed because of just the huge volume that these large plantation farms are able to, mm. are able to uh, achieve. And so, you know, in that sense, you know, how can you, talk about an alternative without talking about uh, land reform and placing a cap on the amount of land that can be formed and, and uh, acreage uh, uh, supports and these types of things. So, you know, talking about, you know, the alternatives, you know, I think, you know, the first thing we have to do is, 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 is think about, you know, ways of, of, of just limiting the growth of these corporations, um, you know, to allow alternatives to be able to survive. It's, it's one thing to be able to create a cooperative, but to be able to, to make it sustainable. Um, you know, and, and keep it going in the face of all the pressure from Walmart and Home Depot and these other people. Then, of course, you work with um, F, uh, F, uh, Southern Cooperatives. And so. mm -hmm. At, um, do you see any possibilities of being able to, um, you know, one of the problems, uh, you know, in this country, saying a limit on anything, you know, I mean, it, it's a, you know, it's, it's a tough sell. Mm -hmm. But what about a, um, uh, is, a um, um, have you seen uh, some successes in being able to to get uh, um, c consumers to support uh, locally grown cooperative or you know uh, 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 produce? Um, being able to support uh, activities that 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 would support their neighbors' uh, uh, kinds of entrepreneurial activity. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, mm. And uh, you know, we were working, you know, primarily in you know, something in Green County um, in West Alabama, and you know, uh, it took us a, it took us a long time, and it was actually the first time these farmers had ever come together and do it and, and did it. But we put together a, a farmers market between something in Green County, like right on the border between us. It was the first time it had ever been able to get together and actually coordinate themselves to do a farmers market. And you know, the success of it was was largely due to the fact that the closest grocery store. For many people, you know, coming out of these rural areas, I mean, very rural, you know, it was 35, 40 minutes drive away to just, just to get to the closest grocery store, and um, and the prices were very high. And many people would go down to Meridian or to Walmart, where the prices were a lot cheaper. And so, you know, just to have this this this, this farmers market set up for people, you know, and they were able to get produce from people who they knew. Um, so, you know, I mean, you know, there's definitely you know those types of opportunities, you know, are there. Um, and I think, you know, the one thing that saved them from Walmart is the fact that they were so rural that it just wasn't a large enough market for a huge Walmart to be able to even consider coming in there or grocery stores to even consider coming in there because it was just so isolated and so rural 
in that region. So that type of thing, you know, we were able to set up. Any <clears throat> other thoughts about how do you know when you got a yes? You know, what are the things that we could say yes to? I just think about organizing mm -hmm. the communities. Mm -hmm. First thing I think about in terms of the long term. Because at the end of the day, the community is their money that they're spending in the store. And <clears throat> at the end of the day, it's their families that, you know, <clears throat> are losing their jobs and um, not having their community needs served by, you know, the big box. So whatever the alternative is going to be, it seems to me, will be successful or not, depending on what the community does. But most communities, of course, are not, don't, who aren't organized to think that way. And even if they are organized, they don't often think in terms of economics. I think organizing combined with asset building, with family-based asset building, so that people are like, generating the sort of capital that they would need in order to start their small businesses, including you know, mobile um, alternatives. Can you hit the, um, the function again so that it comes up here so we can see it? Then we won't be straining our necks on that. Mm -hmm. oh. Lots of both places. So much. So um, sustainable, communities are sustainable when they meet the needs of the present generation without compromising the needs of the future ones. So that's one of the criteria that we're, we're thinking about. And um, when their members maintain or increase the community's resources over time, um, right along with what you were saying. And um, the, the, we're looking at three different ways that these locally owned group-based businesses build sustainable communities. One is economically. With the local ownership and control, um, they, they focus the businesses that they're in on what the community needs. They provide jobs and resources and profits that actually stay in the community because people in the community don't send their stuff away. They don't say, oh, we don't want to work in our factory anymore. We want someone you know, from another country to work in our factory, and let's give up our own jobs. So um, it's a way of rooting assets in the community, and it also increases economic self-sufficiency and security. And your point earlier is that it builds the community's assets, that we're taking on things um that might have been a, a problem, turning a, a, a vacant lot and then turning it into a, a, a positive asset that produces wealth and, and, and empowers the uh, community. So, uh. we, we work with a lot of locally owned group-based businesses that also promote sustainability because you know, people don't foul their own nest quite as easily as they'll foul somebody else's. So if you're in there, you're less likely to put, pollute your water supply and your air supply because you know your kids and their kids are going to be needing that. Um, we work with um, a lot of groups who have who work in uh, sustainable food and sustainable um, sustainable energy, and uh, the uh, food cooperatives were the first that pioneered and opened up the organic food market. Uh, the energy co-ops that we're working with are really pioneering and open up opening up the market for sustainable energy products and services. So um, these kinds of group-based businesses are willing to go into places that you can't make a big profit on. Uh, at least initially, and to help consumers understand why it's in their best interest to care about these things and to change their consumption patterns in order to keep their environment um, safer and wholer and better for their children. And then this also increases the social sustainability. I mean, that also that even important asset of of developing their leadership skills, their ability to to uh, decide, what, to vision, to, to plan together, to work out differences, to to be able to to uh, uh, um, develop those skills uh, sets uh, to to um, move us a. a a, um, a, um, a community forward to deal with all the different stakeholders that they need to deal with in order to bring them together and, and move them in, in one common direction. And, uh, and to me, sometimes that's some of the most exciting things that, that happens in a cooperative. The way, you know, whether it's a, a cooperative, working with a food cooperative in Brooklyn or, or you know, an urban ag in, in, in Buffalo, when you see ordinary folks uh, many times that have just been uh, left out of 
so many different things, not having the educational training, not having the uh, uh, sense that they can make a difference and, and just seeing them just blossom, you know, in, in, a, in a period of months when you, when that person gets moved into leadership positions and, you know, they're learning how to, you know, to read spreadsheets and, uh, you know, and, and, and understand uh, uh, balance sheets and, you know, and, and figuring out and planning, uh, you know, and doing strategic planning, you know, things that they thought you know, it was a whole nother group of people, you know, was their province, you know, but then seeing that, that there's no mystery to it there and that they, they can learn those things too if they work at it, and, you know, and particularly when they're provided the, the uh, proper support. So uh, to me, I think that's one of the, the great things. Even when they, um, to me, even when, they, when we're not able to keep it sustainable and when a, a cooperative is in their area and then, and then uh, dies, the, uh, the results of it always remain. I mean, uh, you know, I've gone back into Brooklyn and, you know, and, and I used to do a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, co-op housing organizing in, in Crown Heights, you know, and when you just run into folks, even if the place is not even uh, the same anymore, I mean, just that, that person is, you know, has been changed. They're a new person. They, they, they understand their own power and, and they carry it into all aspects of their life. They get active on the job. They get active, you know, in their church. They get active in po politically. You know, it, it, it carries over, and so uh, so that's I think one of the great powers of, of that that uh, um, that setting up group-based businesses changes the uh, the landscape uh, by changing the people. I told you earlier that a lot of conversations I have with municipal leaders about cooperatives, they say, well, the, you know, box store development is the only one they know of. And then we talk about co-op development or uh, other group-based business development, and they they say, well, that's really great. Sometimes I have people say, we tried it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was a disaster. All these people were fighting. Nobody could manage the meetings. It was, you know, and we won't ever do it again. And so I talk with, you know, people in CDCs, and 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 I understand that. You know, it's 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 easier to say to you know you you got an idea for a restaurant? Great. Yeah, I'll help you write your business plan and get you the money, and then you can go out and start your business. It's it's a simpler um, equation. But it's um, it's also very thin. Um, it only that restaurant will only be there with you as the owner while you're there in the community and while you're healthy. And you know, it's it's uh, when you have a group of people, you can also have a lot of great ideas and a lot of support. And so sometimes group-based businesses take a little longer. Um, and if people are trying to help start group-based businesses without all the pieces to do it, there's kind of a technology to it you know, managing these groups. And um, you, you can't, just because you've helped start entrepreneurs, single entrepreneurs start a restaurant, that doesn't mean that you have all the skills it takes to help a group of people start a group-based business. Um, there's, there's this added dimension of the whole group process and all of these skills that, you know, that are listed here. And um, what you get is a different, you get a different result. It has a different value in the community. It, it, I don't think it replaces single entrepreneurs at all. You know, I think it's a good complement too. But um, for all the folks you know doing economic development who said, I give up, it's way too hard. You know, what they really need is another partner in there to help manage that group process. And there's technology for doing that just like there's business plans and, you know, governance systems for boards of directors. You know, it's like there's pieces that, and you just need all the pieces. Um, and uh, speaking of the pieces, um, in order to start a group-based business, you need these five things. You need to have a community organizing effort so that people in the community understand why they want this locally rooted group-based business in their community, um, and, um, and, and a, preferably a planning process, a participatory planning process, where people have identified the businesses that they need and which ones of them are best to have as group-based businesses and where, the, where you want to invest community resources into that development process. The second is replicable business models. It's really good to have something you know works, and there are a lot of things that work. Lots and lots and lots of things that work. Um, another, the next thing is technical assistance. Um, someone who knows how to go through this process. And the technical assistance includes all of that group facilitation we were just talking about a second ago, as well as the business planning, as well as the financial analysis skills, um, 
you know, the whole range of what it's personnel, development, everything you need to start a business. It's really important to have technical assistance from people who've been engaged in startup businesses before. Um, to just kind of go out there and expect yourself to be able to recreate all of those wheels, I think is, is um, it, 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 it's any one of these pieces, you don't have every one of these pieces, it probably won't work. It's like a five-legged stool. <laughs> you are going to knock fall out over. Any one of them. <laughs> and depending on one thing, we want to, you know, depending on what the actual project that you're doing, uh, where you're doing it, who you're dealing with, they're, you know, they may grow in terms of, you know, uh, certain projects demand a lot more community organizing to make it happen than, as opposed to another one. Uh, other ones, some demand a heck of a lot more capital. I mean, except, you know, so, so being able to uh, figure out, uh, you know, it, it has a very specific dimension in, in, uh, in terms of the particular project, where you're doing it, what's the history, all, all those things. Huh? Um. And then money from members. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't work on a project unless members up front say to me, I'm willing to put in money and not $10, you know, but I'm really willing to put in money and that depends how much depends on the people and what their resources are and what the needs of the business are. But you know, if, if people want to start, if farmers want to start a processing facility, I'd like for them to all be willing to put in at least five grand, you know, if they're on the low income side or price of a pickup truck if they're, you know, driving around. It just, it doesn't make sense to, if people don't value it enough to put their own resources in, don't put yours. And, and a lot of times uh, when you're dealing with low income folk, you know, we, we get this attitude like, oh, they, well, they can't afford to, to, to uh, do it. I mean, I think it just calls maybe a, a greater amount of creativity. I mean, for example, like the, uh, uh, the home care workers in, in the Bronx, uh, you know, now you know, it's not, a, you know, you're making eight, nine, ten, eleven dollars an hour. It's not a tremendous amount of, um, um, uh, you know, income that available to them. But they, they still set up a process where each um, person they had to buy in with, uh, with a thousand uh, dollars in order to buy in. But then they worked it out where it, uh, it was something like five, six dollars a, a, a week um, uh, went toward it. and. And you didn't have to wait till you, you know. You, I think it was after the first hundred dollars, you 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 had voting rights. So it you know. So you still you was able to become a, uh, and, and be a part a democratic part of that 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 process. But you had had to have that personal responsibility and that buy-in. And I, in my attitude, I, you know, I've I've done I've organized the uh, you know networks of six hundred block clubs in Buffalo, bringing them together, and some of the poorest uh, communities. And you know, if Everybody can come up with something. I mean, we would, you know, uh, in order that for them to be a part of, it, even if it was, even if it was five bucks, you know, that just that 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 buy-in. Then then they were more, you you had them more seriously a, a part of. It. Their body was more in it, you know, it's, uh, you know, and so, and so that in terms of that commitment, and, and you know, so I think it, it's it's um, it's essential, you know, in terms of, um, you know, I think that's one of the, the strengths and power of the of the uh, of the of the group building uh, uh, process. Uh, business process is, you know, is is is, is, is making sure that everyone, um, uh, you know, th that self reliance, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's that's involved when everyone uh, puts up something toward it, and and you know, and then we can still figure out other ways. Um, you know, certain, uh, tax, you know, we, we might do more grants, uh, or you know, something uh, um, um, from a foundation, uh, you know, to assist uh, getting a, a low income uh, cooperative off the ground, but. There still has to be that money from the members at the beginning, and like I said, and I think that's every time I've seen where uh, uh, you, folks have tried to go around that, uh, the, the results were disastrous, and um, and it, and it caught, and there were problems in terms of people being serious, you know, in terms of their not only just on the money side, but on in terms of their activity, their commitment to it, and willingness their to sustain, yeah. you know, willingness to sustain. It takes a lot of work to sustain mm -hmm. these group-based businesses, and if you don't have any sweat in the game, yeah. you know, it's easy. You walk away, yeah. you know, and you might take a few things with you. It's just, you know, people need to buy in, both, you know, with their time and their and their cash, mm -hmm. um, and then you need money from other sources. So if people want to start um, a print shop. You know, and they, they, okay, I want to, I'm going to, we've got these five people together. We think we'd like to start a print shop. There isn't one nearby. People are always looking for a place to get things copied. We got to buy the copier. Mm -hmm. You know, like, well, we can each put in $500. Mm -hmm. 
well, we've been saving up for a year. You know, we each got $500 together. And that's a quarter of what's needed. You know, you have to have an idea where you're going to get the rest of it from. You know, you're going to be comfortable talking to the local bank. You're going to be comfortable putting together what's needed to go talk to the local bank. Um, but just thinking through, is there a place that might be willing to help either bring in equity or bring in other debt to make this business happen? Um, so what I'd like to do with this, these are, these are to me so important that um, if you're talking or thinking about doing any project without all five of those things, I'd really want to counsel you to reconsider or to see if you can find the one or two or three that are missing. There's a lot of groups that say, oh, community development credit union, they're all over. It works. And we're great organizers. Let's start one. Come on. Let, can you come to the meeting? OK, let's meet tomorrow night, and we're going to get started. And you meet, and you meet, and you meet, and you meet, and it's like, what's happening? What's not happening? Well, why isn't it happening? It's because you don't have the right, you don't have all the ingredients. You know, you're making a cake without any eggs or liquid ingredients. It's like not working. So, um, yeah, so I'd li what I'd like to do is take these five and um, think through a rating scale. It's like if you, if you had a rating scale from zero to five for community organizing, what would a zero be? No community organizing skills. What would a zero look like? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to type this up and have it for us when we're talking about case studies. So you can look at things that you know of that have worked and not worked. And I just want to kind of like go down and just be able to rate them. Let's do it zero to three just so it's really fast. But just so we can kind of take a look at, well, probably why didn't that work? Oh, there was uh, no money from members. But I I'd guarantee for all the, things, all the projects you know that didn't work, they didn't have one. And all the projects you know that worked, they had all of them. I don't think there's exceptions. How's that? Try to prove me wrong. I'd love it. Um, so what would a zero be for community organizing? Well, it might or might not make sense, but who would know? Right. There's nobody's talking to anybody, right? right. So there's no conversation. No, no common planning process. I mean, right here. Um, so, and you see that a lot. I mean, like I said, where, where like I said, the AD will say, hey, you know, this is, would be a great idea. Let's form a, a youth worker co-op. They went to a, you know, they read a book or they went to a land, and, you know, and then, uh, but then uh, they, have they talked to a group of young people first? I mean, and, and, this, and, and kind of began to tease it out. Uh, what are your issues? What are your concerns? Would you like, what, what, here's an approach. What do you think about that? Or did you just design that idea, you know, from the top of your head and then said, assign some people and say, get busy on it. Yeah. So what would a one look like? So this is in the middle. The one I know good, too. It's, it's uh, you have people on the advisory. You know, you have tokenized people in different positions where they're in an advisory role or something, where they're our community member on our board or something. Um, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Like a CDC that has a resident on the board, right, right. Right. Yeah. Right. two residents on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, how, and how about a two? Uh, uh, oh, geez. We're just going to go on a zero to two. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I was about to say a two would be um, if you're going to go to three. No, let's go. Let's, uh, oh, okay, go ahead. Um, a two would be um, like I've been, you know, at like you know, community meetings and, you know, like, like a housing development and they're talking about stuff, but no one's taking notes and, uh, you know, the residents come and complain and talk about stuff. And, and they disperse them. So it's just venting instead of really uh, yeah. uh, consulting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think we should go with okay. because even in, or they have a really good public mm. process, mm. but then it has no connection to, so mm. even though like maybe mm. someone is taking notes or that meeting's run really well, you know, and there's mm. good information there, but then the final outcome comes out and there's a total disconnect, mm. or it's something's implemented or something's not implemented, but mm. there's but that doesn't connect, the good public participatory mm -hmm. process doesn't mm -hmm. connect mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. right. I like um, city planning meetings where mm -hmm. I invite residents to come mm -hmm. and speak. And, you know. 
politicians. And what? Yeah. And meanwhile, they already have the plan yeah. you know, in their back pocket. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so let's see how many times you agree with me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more learning where there's no understanding of what's winnable at the end. And so it can, you, uh, you will allow people to go beyond what's actually realistic or what the group is capable of accomplishing. So it can be a wonderfully participatory process that crashes because it lacks understanding of, you know, their vision isn't really coherent. Mm -hmm. Or it could be everyone speaking English, but most of the community folks speak another language. <laughs> yeah. And there's no yeah, yeah. yeah, and there's no translation. <laughs> This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> the, head, the head of the housing authority telling residents the reason why no one is hiring them is because they dress bad and people are afraid of their gold teeth and uh, the way that they comb their hair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zero. 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 Okay, what does the three look like? Yeah. Three. <laughs> no one knows. It's good facilitation. An understanding of what's winnable. Um, I think, um, translation. But the, the, the final thing isn't totally defined until, you know, it's not, it's not <coughs> here's we're coming together to plan this. And then, so that it's the, the, the final outcome is defined by the process, by the group, which is hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then a commitment by the group to follow the function that they decide to pursue rather than a desire to create a body that is then static and not able to adapt to wherever they decide to go. Because I think a lot of times the organizing suddenly becomes, leads to the formation of a group that then is not capable of adapting to whatever they've decided to pursue. So kind of having that inform the process. So along, sorry, no. well, along those lines, that the process of leading up to it that the organizing process reflects what the thing will actually be and that the and that the group that comes together to do that work stays together and continues forward. Something in that process hooked people, engaged people, changed people like you were talking about mm -hmm. and, and kept them at the table. So they got something out of it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just gonna say something similar to that, but just the local leadership capacity is developed where they're not dependent on the uh, on the uh, in our community developers. Mm -hmm. To, to always provide this um, technical assistance. Mm -hmm. To me, the sign of a, a great meeting or a great process is one where everyone ends up in a different place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where it's not like someone came in with a plan and agenda and then mm -hmm. they went through the agenda, and, but there's it's so vigorous, there's so much exchange and listening mm -hmm. going on that everyone sort of comes out mm -hmm. different than how they came in. When you see somebody move from the back of the room to the front of the room at the next meeting, then you, you know something yeah. good is happening. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, so, so. Or you know you're yeah, right. <laughs> depending, right. depending who that was, right? yeah. right. and what, what they have in their pocket. Um, the uh, the way I talk about that is creating shared vision. Yeah. You know that people kind of all walk in as individuals, but mm. the the process. Of, of speaking and listening just kind of moves people to that other place where they go, oh yeah, we can see this and we, we do, we, we want that. Oh, I guess maybe it's not that, it's this right here, you know, and everybody comes out and the more conversation, the clearer that vision gets and the more buy-in everybody has. How about the next one? Zero on replicable business models. You ever been to a meeting like that? Or with a group like that? Like a department thing, academia. <laughs> 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 no models for that. <laughs> I guess I kind of like need to know more about this one because um, I don't know business models as much, but as more, in terms of organizing models or community development or planning models, mm -hmm. everyone always wants that replicable model, and so I kind of like, like I'm kind of like, oh God, what's replicable? Because my experience has been like things don't always, they're not, things that work aren't always replicable. And, so and I'm not talking program. about a process. I'm right. talking about community development credit unions. 
community land trusts for housing, preserving affordable housing. Mean, there's things we know that really work, and they work really well. You know, there's, there's a long list of them. Um, so instead of saying, I'd like to start a rock climbing co-op. OK, well, maybe that's OK. But you might get a zero on this scale. And it might not work, because we don't really know how to build rock climbing co-ops. I mean, maybe, maybe that was a bad idea. It might be fun. But, <laughs> but land trusts, you know, you know they work. You've seen them work. Yeah. Are there times when, you know, the when they wouldn't the work? Right yeah, yeah. And yeah. so is that part of yeah. this, this bullet as well? And having, a, yeah, having enough information about what the various models exist. I mean, like the, 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 the example of, you know, folks saying, Let's have a credit union, or let's have a worker co-op. But then they haven't, uh, you know, taken the uh, the extra a step to say, okay, well, what are some successful credit unions and, and worker co-ops, and what do they look like, and what are some of the common traits, and uh, um, you know, and and uh, you know, what are some interesting different uh, activities that different ones did that might have some. Uh, um, uh, a bearing on on our situation, you know. So I think you know, particularly just getting people to see that there that uh, there uh, approaches of uh, different ways of looking at things, uh, you know, not only in this country but around the world. Even. Uh, um. Yeah, I think that um, like you know, while you know businesses or organizations mm. will have you know their own nuances you know, mm. that make them unique, but I think you know that there are just some rules, like you know, to a cooperative like. Um, uh, with the federation, we work uh, with a uh, catering co-op, mm. and um, you know we, we you know we uh, basically subsidized it for I think it was like the first nine months or just to get them get them going, and um, you know but they just kept breaking the rules and you know instead of you know taking you know um, you know paying themselves you know you know some salary I forgot exactly mm. how much that they had initially agreed to pay themselves. Mm -hmm and then taking the profit and reinvesting it, you know, to keep the co-op strong. They took everything. <laughs> so there's nothing left to reinvest. <laughs> they made some good food, though. <laughs> very, very good food. I was so they catered so it, so and then I did it. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, so, you know, so, so there's those types of just, just rules about how to do a cooperative, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, are important. I think those kind of replicable, replicable business models mm -hmm. are important, because otherwise you get a case like that. Where, you know, they're just taking all the profit and not reinvesting it. Mm -hmm. They just fall apart and wonder why. And you know, I think maybe we should edit this because it's not so much replicable mm -hmm. as feasible. Yeah, feasible. Right. Okay. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. I think that's what I was going for. Yeah, and and, and it would be therefore rec replicable you know, right. if it's feasible. Yeah, but we, yeah, we're right. for feasible. It doesn't Things have to always. It doesn't work. have to have been done a yeah. million times already. Although mm -hmm. that's a little safer. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rock climbing club. You know, if you put a good business plan together and you got the right people in your mm -hmm. right place, you know? <laughs> Planners love feasibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, it's like when you go to a meeting and at the end they're like, let's start a listserv, and you're like, is that what we came here for? They also rate them usually zero, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so, so I. I so let's talk about feasible business models. Mm. I, I sit with a lot of groups that say, We've been meeting for six months. We know exactly what we want to do. We want to do this and this and this. So we're going to make these products for these consumers, and then we're going to sell it to these people, and then we're going to make these things, and we're going to do this. And it's like, I'm just exhausted by the time I, if they finish telling me. <laughs> and none of them have ever done it before. And you know, it's, it's just, oh, goodness. So anyway, so so. How would you how would you rank a zero um, for a feasibility feasible business model? What do they look like? No plan. No plan. No no connection. No learning from anyone who's done it before. Can I say no focus? Because yeah. that's I, no strategy. No focus. Probably good enough. How about a one or a two or a three? What do you think? What's the scale now? It's We're going from zero to three. Oh, yeah, okay. We're making it up as we go along. I know when we did the empowerment center in New York, we had mm -hmm. hundreds mm -hmm. of proposals. 
for businesses, you know, for folks wanting money, you know, to support. And, you know, the, many of them were just add-ons to something that someone was struggling with already. But it wasn't really clear that they were serving a need in the community, um, that it had growth potential, uh, you know, basically, um, there was there was no reason to support it in particular, one over another. You couldn't even evaluate one over mm -hmm. another. And to, I, most of the proposals I saw were just like that. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the entrepreneurs um, were not organized together either. They didn't support each other whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So they weren't realizing mm -hmm. any efficiencies. In the housing area, they weren't buying insurance together, they weren't buying fuel together, nothing. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I would give that a one. Mm -hmm. So if we said the, the one is which? Sorry, mm -hmm. I, I was on zero for that. But you, you said one. one, yeah. I will say one, someone has a business, but its growth potential is unclear, its market is unclear, it doesn't cooperate or work with other businesses to realize efficiencies on things like yeah. mm -hmm. buying products or, you know, there's there's no real vision about how to grow. Mm -hmm. Great. And two is somewhere in, in the middle. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. We'll just keep Great. moving. And technical assistance. What's a zero for a group with, that has access to zero technical assistance? <laughs> nobody's at the table with any experience. Mm. Yeah. You know, nobody's done any of it before. Mm. And also can't even identify what the thing is that they need. Because sometimes you don't, if no one's at the table, who knows? You don't even, <laughs> you don't know, even know what you don't know. Mm. Oh, that's something like run to <laughs> It's the unknowables. <laughs> And then, um, and let's just say a three, I'm going to kind of mm -hmm. move us forward. A three is a group has the technical expertise in each of the areas that they come across. They're, they're able to access someone who's done it before, and not only done it before, but done it well, and been successful at it. So they know that they're getting really good business planning, financial analysis, you know, the whole, all those steps along the way. And I feel like, and I don't know what I'm talking about, but people that have those skills and also understand what you're trying to do because I'm working right now with like Harvard Business School finance people and they have those skills can we just say you know what I mean but if they don't yeah. understand the community organizing aspects or the other stuff that you're trying to do I feel like they're skilled or not as useful as they should be. I think that's one of the things that we're um, trying to get across in this is it's um, knowing you know, being like a, a, a good coach, I mean, of a, of a, of a, of a, a team, you know, knowing which, what is the proper player for the, for the, for the proper, you know, bringing the, the right set of skills. I mean, uh, you know, so knowing somebody that would be great in terms of do, doing your financials, but should never even uh, walk in the room with, uh, with, the, with the community folk, you know, I mean, or, or, or get, vice versa or something. But to get the financials mm -hmm. done, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm working on this biodiesel mm -hmm. production facility, and it's $3.7 million that we're raising. We're talking with outside equity investors. And, you know, if I didn't have somebody with an MBA in finance who understood this co-op project mm -hmm. and could translate, and sit at the table with me with the venture capitalists and say, you know, they say, well, what's the IRR? And I go to Larry and say, I think that's internal rate of return, but do you know what it is? You know, he calculates it and tells it, you know, but I, I don't have those skills. Um, he has those skills, and if he, if he didn't understand the co-op, he could do that stuff for me. But there's a whole lot about this project that needs to be integrated into the financials that, you know, if he didn't already really get what we were doing and why, I, I would have a really hard time. So, ac and access to lawyers. You've got a great lawyer who's never, ever dealt with any co-op law, legal statute, any worker-owned legal statute. It's like, they're going to want, you're going to need them to do a lot of studying. Read the whole statute, look at other sample, you know, 
incorporation documents, whatever. They got to do a lot of work to get up to speed. So just because you got financial skills or legal skills doesn't mean you're good for these projects. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get lawyers and accountants mm -hmm. who have the background you need. And part of our excitement in, in talking to folk like you, I mean, and I, I mean, is is that we're not going to be successful unless we begin to populate. Um, uh, uh, we need to be able to create more experts that that are not only are, are skilled, you know, in, 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 in certain business kind of savvy kind of uh, uh, skills that they need, whether it's financials and other things, but also have an appreciation of the community organizing part. You know, that, that you know, expect that you know the, the the things we need to do to raise the capital, the things we need to do to you know the the, the, the train folks so that they develop their capacity. We got to begin to start creating that corpse of uh, folk that 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 can you know walk kind of uh, smoothly into all these different worlds and uh, um, you know and and that like I said that there there are folks out there and uh, but it does take some real um, I think one of the points there is that it it requires you just can't say uh, let me call the first lawyer or the or the first accountant that, that you really need to, to talk to them like I said if, if they haven't had that experience. Then, I, but how are they open? Are they willing to to to, to learn? Uh, you know, to do some study, to do some, uh, you know, uh, to talk to. You know, can you connect them up with? You know, and would they would be willing to connect up, talk with some other folk from another region that that have more of those experiences? And like I said it's it's uh, it's complicated, and and a lot a lot of times uh, uh, some serious mistakes are made when folks don't appreciate that. Uh, you know that. Uh, 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 you know that, you, and, and when you find places like CDIs around the country where they've tried to bring together that focused uh, skill set, you know they play a very special role, and we need we need we need you know a 50, 100 times more of them than, than than we have right now. And lots of times we'll go in and work with a CDC or another group to who's got a project that they haven't ever done this kind of before and mm -hmm. so we'll help them you know hook up with the lawyers in their area or the accountants mm -hmm. or the facilitators who know who understand enough about business development to be able to run those meetings mm -hmm. and whatever so fun stuff so we're on money from members yes <laughs> organizing so a zero is there's just been no organizing that's happened at all I've so also I've also had people you know somebody some champion for the project goes out and say housing just come and join you'll it, we will never charge market rate you know this is going to be this is low income housing and it's going to be for you and you're not going to have to pay anything you know so I mean, so there's sometimes there's organizing done, but it's done with you know the wrong message going out. You don't have to put anything in here. This is just a gift to you. So so zero is no money down. One is one dollar in. Two is two dollar. No. Um, but so three is. Um, I think three is. I, you know, I watched my mother organize church people go on these cruises. People have very no money, yeah. very little right. money. And she spends the first couple of months after people, after payday comes, you know, mom's right there before they can hit the beer garden, you know, there's mom, you know, and, and she collects, you know, $25, you know, weekly, but she's really on it these first two months. But the thing is, once you put your money in, you don't get it back regardless, you know? Mm -hmm. Folks sign up, they want to go, they put their first 25, their second. What happens is, after they have $200 in, she doesn't call anybody because their money's in it then. <laughs> they already know. You know, they're, they're not getting it back. They call them back. You know, they want to make sure, you know, they don't fall behind. Somebody's going on the cruise. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because the whole dynamic changes. And that's to me, that's a very a interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Strat I gotta got to try that out. one. Oh, she's, she's like, yeah, I was going to say, um, added to that, not, not uh, for, number, for number three, not just to say that, you know, you get, you know, your members to pay, but I think uh, what's important in getting them to pay, because a lot of organizations that I've been a part of, we tried to collect dues and these types of things, there was never any uh, sort of like uh, a specific uh, target or say, you know, well, you know, we need, 
this amount of money for this. You know, it was just it was just too open ended, and people are like, well, what are I'm giving money? Like, what, what do we need it for? You know, we have, you know, why do we need to pay these dues this month? You know, to, to you know to do what? You know, to print out some more paper. We could do that for three hundred million. We can do it someplace else. But if there was like some target that people were shooting for, and there was some way to conceptualize that this this is what the money was going to, and then be able to see the return at the end of it, I think that would be you know a way. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. And, and for me, a three is you finished your business plan. You know what capital the business is going to need to start. Is it going to need $10, $100,000, $3.7 You know how much you need. And you've got a strategy for getting it in. And the members are, are purchasing a significant portion of the business. They're not purchasing 1% of the business with their member equity. They're purchasing 30% of the business, maybe. You know, but a significant portion is coming from members, so they actually do own it. It's not just the banks or some grant that's owning this business. It's really them. Um, um, and then money from other sources. What's a zero? No idea of where to get it. <laughs> It's going to fall from heaven when we need it. Number two is venture capital. <laughs> Same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... I'm going to pick up this last well, time. You know, <laughs> most of them want to own you and, you know, your kids and everything else, you know, okay. at the end of the day. Great, and three is you. You know, you got a really solid plan, and you 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 got you got three people for every one that you need to bring in. You know, um, and the last ingredient is you have to have these things in place to sustain that business once you get it going. So it's got to be ongoing education and training, resources, public policy advocacy, industry information and technical assistance because guaranteed there are bumps in the road either something big's going to change in the environment you know in your industry or there's going to be a new law that comes in and either messes with your business or makes your business work um, there's 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 your board is going to need to get trained you're going to get a whole new board within a few months you know after the next annual election, there'll be you know a third of the new board members, and they need to training how to do what they're doing. Yeah, um, that's, that's, and that I think has a, a lot to do with why so many of, of these efforts don't uh, sustain and, and, and continue. That we're not paying attention. You know, we, we go through this effort, you know, to set them up, and then you know, not understanding that you know, even it's lot, sometimes even it might be just the uh, challenges from success. All of a sudden, you know, you've done so well, and all of a sudden now, other people are like, "Whoa, you know, I want some of that." You know, and then you got all of a sudden you got predators and competitors and everything else that 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 uh, that when you were a small fry doing dealing with a, a need that, you know, the big uh, community you know thought was totally unimportant, you know, or, or, or totally uh, um, imp impossible to to really do something about. Once you prove that that something can be done. You know uh, uh, that that success brings you a whole new set of problems. How do we deal with it? Like I said, I mean, uh, the uh, the the kinds of leadership issues uh, that 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 people uh, go through. And you know, once you, uh, uh, think something has been around three years, five years, seven years, ten years, you know, um, each each one of them are, are things that we need to be doing a better job at expect at, at preparing for. And um, and and you know, and I think, like I said, that this is. I think been one of the, the the greatest weaknesses that 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 we face that we don't you know we don't think about the long term, term uh, sustainability and we don't make sure that all of these pieces are in place. I would add strategic planning somewhere because almost every effort I've been associated with, mm -hmm. yeah, as as soon as it it's like up and operational, it yeah. gets sedimented yeah. very quickly. You know? Yeah, got a great plan. You, that put it on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. You don't, yeah. you're not looking at it every few months. So and, you know, it, every, you know, you know yeah. has anything changed? Uh, yeah. You know. yeah, a very good point. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we just wanted to run through just a little bit about what is out there right now. 
Um, and in the Northeast, there's uh, 162 agricultural cooperatives with 82,000 members and five billion in sales. You can see 1,400 credit unions. You can see 60 retail food co-ops and 1,500 pre-order buying clubs. There's um, uh, 55 firms with 4,300 member workers who are, are either in a worker co-op or an ESOP. There's 600,000 units of uh, cooperative housing. There are um, retailer-owned wholesale cooperatives, ShopRite, Ace, True Value, Best Western, Dunkin' Donuts, KFC. Um, there are day school and preschool cooperatives, regional educational cooperatives, healthcare co-ops, uh, municipal co-ops, just a, a, a wide variety of lots of other kinds of cooperatives. So just to give you a sense, here in the Northeast there's 10,000 cooperatives with, uh, with um, 10 million members. It's not insignificant. And there are lots of other group-based businesses. Th these are the ones I have stats on. Um, do you want to? Yeah, as I said, I mean, one of the points is that we haven't, uh, you know, part of it is, is our mistake as a, a part of the cooperative movement, that we haven't done a good enough job of marketing that, you know, we have a thing called MOCA, marketing our cooperative advantage, and letting folks know that, that you know, that, that there are, um, that most folks are touched by cooperatives in some way, that every day in the U.S., uh, 100 million um, men, women, and ch children are affected by cooperatives and other group-based businesses. Uh, you know, 13.3 uh, million checks and 1.3 billion dollars by uh, by credit unions. Uh, uh, Three million people and go to cooperative housing units. Uh, and no, just uh, this example, amalgamated housing was one of the first uh, um, um, housing cooperatives back in 1920s, uh, uh, and the Nickel City Housing Co-op was just formed last year. So it's it's a it's a continuum that is uh, that continues to, to grow at, and particularly needs to grow even more as, as our housing prices become uh, less and less affordable for many more and more people. And amalgamated mm -hmm. housing was mm -hmm. developed with a labor union yeah. consumer alliance to build housing for people in communities and it's the reason um, New York City is affordable to working class people is because the unions and the cooperatives and the consumer co-ops work together to create housing and food resources and energy resources that are still um, sustaining working class folks in New York today. Love to get back to that. Yeah. And you know, then uh, uh, like I said, 11 million people going uh, to, to work at, uh, at, at uh, worker co-ops and ESOPs and that's a growing thing as uh, particularly more and more uh, folks are aging out and, uh, um, and, and you know, how can you keep that business that was been functioning and, but the, the, the kids don't, you know, don't care for that family business anymore. A lot of folks are turning to worker co-ops and ESOPs. Um, uh, 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 cooperative uh, health approaches, uh, 60,000 people and, 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 th and that number is going to grow uh, a lot. I mean, th th there's a lot of attention at how, how can we come up with some cooperative uh, uh, group-based ap approaches to uh, to a healthcare problem, so uh, you know, every day, uh, 1.2 million dollars in and uh, and uh, goods at natural food cooperatives and buying clubs. I mean, uh, this whole organic food industry, you know, it's really, you know, as we talked said before, came from the. Uh, um, we were the ones that helped to, to set the uh, uh, the possibilities for it. Um, and, you know, and, uh, the the uh, uh, hardware uh, store cooperatives, Ace, True Values, etc. I mean, that that's. One way that, that they've been able to survive somewhat against the big boxes is uh, is through uh, purchasing co-ops, uh, uh, where they uh, brought together these uh, um, um, you know just uh, thousands of uh, individual uh, uh, franchises and, and 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 buying together. That's if it, you know uh, an important way to be able to to, to fight behemoths like uh, uh, like uh, 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 Walmart and the Home Depot and etc. Every industry, uh, mm -hmm. every small business industry is being taken over by consolidation, and so the only way that they're staying in business so I, is by forming purchasing cooperatives. So there's funeral home cooperatives that are the only thing that are keeping locally owned funeral homes in our country. There's um, uh, I worked with. A, fire, a group of fireproofing installers nationally who are trying to do that. It's, it's, it's uh, the largest growing sector of cooperative businesses are these purchasing cooperatives to sustain small businesses. There's, welcome, welcome. How you doing? And if, I'll just 
make the announcement again. If anybody doesn't want to be on our lovely videotape, you need to sit in this section of the room. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome. So there's um, 25 million people who get their electricity from consumer cooperatives. Um, they own all the poles and wires and 75% of the United States, all the rural areas. And uh, the cooperative daycare centers is a, you know, a new approach. I mean, particularly as uh, the more and more attention to the importance of uh, daycare as a way to uh, get folks in, into the workforce. Um, uh, a cooperative approach is a, as a way to come up with quality daycare that, 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 that more people can afford um, is, is a, a, an important new, uh, option. Um, and uh, and that, that all over the world, uh, 600 million people all over the world are participating in cooperatives. And, and, and a lot of the, um, some of the most imaginative and creative and innovative ap approaches are happening in different parts of the world, whether we're talking about Mondragon uh, uh, Cooperative uh, Federation in, in Spain, where they, you know, a handful of students, um, you know, uh, 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 connecting up with uh, Father uh, 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 Resumento, Miento, you know, back in the 40s. And, uh, and from that, now, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, $5 billion um, uh, worth in, in, in total sales, manufacturing, uh, financials, uh, uh, you know, and all, all, just all uh, retail, construction. And, uh, you know, and, and we think that has great bearing. I mean, here it's created in this uh, oppressed uh, minority area of the Basque uh, region of Spain, and, and the, using that as a way to begin to, to focus their attention, uh, you know, a market that nobody else cared about or wanted, and now that they're a global player. I mean, we think that has a, a lot of, uh, that we can learn, particularly for, um, for uh, folks of uh, racial minorities and others, and, you know, in our country. Uh, uh, the, the many things that we can learn from uh, the Mondragon movement. The Siakatsu movement, I think one of some of the most exciting things happened, you know, 60s, 300 uh, families coming together to, to uh, mostly uh, uh, women um, to uh, uh, fight for uh, lower milk prices and, and, and milk that wasn't uh, adult, uh, you know, uh, 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 the milk products, but, but, but genuine milk. And from that, they've built a, 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 a movement where almost a quarter of the, of the people in, 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 in Japan are organized in, in what they call a Han structure, uh, uh, almost block by block organizing, where folks are, are um, you know, and they're not just a consumer uh, cooperative where they're saying, uh, we want low prices. They're demanding uh, and, and cutting deals with consumers, with the producers themselves, saying, okay, Look, we can guarantee you uh, you're a, a, um, a dairy, and we can guarantee you um, this much uh, 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 business. What's the not only the cost that are you going to get to us, but also what is the quality? You know, so they you know so they've uh, been able to you know to talk you know combine low cost and and high quality, which we haven't been able to do in this country, and and they've turned it into a political movement. I'm where, where now it's. Uh, they're, they're, um, uh, they have a strong environmental focus. They're running candidates based on that. Uh, they've been able to raise enough monies from the, the group-based businesses that they've, uh, 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 that they've uh, invested in to be able to support political change in, 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 uh, in Japan. And now, I mean, from that, you know, a large number, I mean, it, like I said, still a very a woman-led movement in a, in, a, in a patriarchal country. And, and, and now and they're be beginning to make a difference, uh, uh, you know. So it, I think it has tremendous things that we can learn. I, I'm thinking, uh, uh, talking about just neighborhood organizing, which I've done quite a bit of. The idea of being able to organize door by door, talking about you know as they call it, siyakatsu uh, sha. I mean, which means a cooperative style, a, a cooperative way of living. You know, wh where they begin to say, not only do we, are we going to just get together to buy milk and dairy and, and meats and other things, but how can we start to think cooperatively, act cooperatively in, in our daily living? And, and, they, and, they, and they've organized so that every eight to ten houses are, are, are meeting together in, in, in Hans, and, you know, and then there's a structure that takes it up to a democratic governance of this national structure. You know, so I think it's you know, tremendous possibilities of how we can take you know, community organizing and, and a cooperative process and, and, and really try to develop Power over how the uh, 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 the, pr pro uh, the producers um, impact, you know, so we can begin to make demands to the WalMarts of the, of the world, uh, and then uh, you know, uh, uh, SACO, uh, the uh, uh, South South African uh, Credit Union, uh, where they, uh, you know, again, where they're organizing using uh, uh, all kinds of creative ways of uh, 
of uh, using uh, their culture in other ways, you know, to, to talk about financial literacy, to, 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 to en engage folks in, in their own, in, in uh, uh, taking power, uh, their fi financial empowerment, of, you know, and they're, you know, going from, from, the, from the individual tribes to, 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 to organizing in the, uh, um, in the uh, cities. Uh, and and it's, it's, again, the, you know, being able to show that, uh, 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 you know, that, that uh, and they've done a lot of things with uh, linking culture, I mean, with a, a credit union that has some of the, the, you know, produces some incredible music and, and dances and everything. I mean, where they, everything is all combined and, you know, and, and to, to build the power of this uh, uh, movement using the culture and using the, uh, the dance and using song as a way of, uh, of, of talking about, uh, uh, educating uh, in, a, in a broad way about how people can take power over their financial lives. So again, I mean, it goes back to the point we're talking about again about uh, feasible uh, business models that one of the things that we got to do out in this country is break this, uh, you know, this uh, mindset that only things that are important are things that happen in this country and not in this, and, and begin to look at the incredible things that they're doing in Canada and Europe and Asia and Africa and Latin America, you know, around the uh, cooperatives. So, uh. so in our culture where we only cooperate when we have to, um, it's hard for us to understand that there are other ways of being in the world and that there are other things that work besides the things that we've seen and we've done. And you can't grow up in a farm community in the Midwest without having cooperatives be most of your life. That is, they have feed, food uh, feed co-ops and marketing co-ops and, you know, co-op stores because there's so much disinvestment in those rural areas. You, you, and there's places that I visited in Atlantic Canada where you can be born in a cooperative hospital and die in a cooperative funeral home and do all of your economic activity in between with cooperatives because everybody else left town and they either had to move or create their own infrastructure and they stayed with the help of the Catholic Church and rebuilt their whole infrastructure. So um, if anybody, I'm hoping that you all will leave today, if you didn't know much about co-ops before you came in, knowing that if somebody says, oh yeah, we tried to do that once and it didn't work, knowing that there's another answer and there's some other options and there's some other people who actually have figured this out. And um, once you know how to do something, it's really easy to do again, but the first time sometimes could be a little challenging. Um, I think I want to, let's go into the role play. Okay. <laughs> um, what I, actually what I'd like to do, I'm just going to abandon this for a moment, yeah. all right? What I'd like to do is take you into the handout that says first things first. And um, what Shakur and I did was we pulled together our favorite things that we've been using over the last 10 years when we sat down to work with a group of people. And we edited them so they're even better than anything we've ever used with people before. <laughs> and it was really fun to take the time to go through and do that. So I'm hoping you'll find these. This is our little, you know, our little Bible for, you know, when you're first getting started with a group. Um, so the first things are strategic planning. You know, that's the first thing you do. We, we, we continue with it later on and we start with it at the beginning. Um, and really creating the share, a shared business, a shared vision for the business. Um, some groups I've worked with, it's been, you know, nine months before we came out with a shared vision. You know, there was one group um, that I worked with where, um, uh, and other people in my office, we, we met with them for nine months, and there were about 50 people in the room for the, all the first meetings and they wanted to start a photovoltaics manufacturing company. And, but they weren't really sure. And, but they wanted to be worker owned, but they weren't really sure who was gonna work in it, whether any of them were, or whether they all wanted to, or whether that would work. So it was, it was we, kind of, we kind of muddled, and there really wasn't money at the table. They, but they were meeting, and they were really enthusiastic about creating a manufacturing company. And um, as we went along, the vision became kind of more realistic and more realistic, and they ended up starting a photovoltaics installation company that's, that's going now. But it, we did probably nine months of this strategic planning work. And what I'm proud of is that we didn't move forward with that 
development process until the group had a shared vision for what it was they wanted to do. And it's hard because, you know, as soon as they get one idea, there's a group of them that wants to go off and start, well, we're going to start the business planning process, you know, let's get the feasibility and do market research. And, uh, anyway, so it was nice. Or oh, actually what, what, what some groups do is they want to start the publicity. Let's call a press conference because this is what we're going to do. So, and there was a lot, you know, there's a lot of that that happened with this particular group. And there was consensus among everyone. That to that's, start that, the publicity. That that's what, or that, oh. that the manufacturing was what they wanted, to, or the installation. Well, they wanted. didn't really know. Maybe it was going to be, um, you know, wind turbine parts. Maybe it was going to be solar um, panel parts. Maybe, you know, there was a lot of, and none of them had any experience in any manufacturing. So, it, you know, it just took a while to get to something where we could hit bottom, where they could get a whole, get access to some of the other um, elements of that puzzle, you know, um, and, and get enough information so they could actually come to clarity about what they were going to do. Yeah. I guess my question is, is it, was it sort of like a majority rule kind of thing? I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, all right, we've got to do something. <laughs> and, and does everybody have to be on board or? It's so tricky. How, how do you answer that question? Yeah, no, so I, it's, you, you got to, it, it, there's no stock answer. I, I think feeling that, that at least a, uh, there's a strong consensus. I mean, you, you know, um, you never usually get 100%, but at least uh, trying to get a sense that a number of the key players, uh, the, um, the uh, very vocal ones and the even the not so vocal ones, that, that, that there's that they should actually share the vision and ready to move forward, you know. But like, so I, you know, and it's a it's a juggling act because you know also the other issue is that you, you don't want to stay too long in a process of just uh, visioning and not and not getting out and doing things. And so you got you know so you you, you got to balance that need to get out and get something done so people can feel like there's a reason to it, but also making sure that that there's a, that that you got a, a a solid a feasible plan. That, that has the possibility of some success. And so, so it's, some, mm. it, some groups I've worked with, they've actually split up and gone in different directions. Yeah. You know, half of them decided, oh, we really want to do this, and the other half said, oh, no, we really want to do this. Some groups never come to agreement. Yeah. And I'm not in charge. Yeah. You know, as the co-op development support person, I'm just, no, you know, I just feed back to them and say, I'm noticing that, you know, eight of you look like you're ready to move, and three of you, um, you know, want to stay in the room and keep talking. So what would you like to do? Mm -hmm. And just, you know, ask the group, what is your decision-making process? Mm -hmm. Who are the decision-makers here? Is everyone in the room participating in the decision? Oh, no, no, not Sally and Joe. This is the first time they came to a meeting, you know, so they don't get to vote. We're going to, the rest of us are voting, you know, and so the, it's the group's decision mm -hmm. about who decides and when. And so it's my job to just keep helping them to be clear about what their decision-making process is and who's included in it. Yeah. Um, I said we'll talk a little more about that, that role, because I mean, it can get um, a little dicey at different points. Something like, say, when, it, when it, you know, at, the point, at certain points saying, this is not making sense, I wish you the best, but uh, I got to go elsewhere because <laughs> I only have so much time and only so much things I can do. I mean, it, like so I'm working with a, a group in Buffalo. I mean, that it was there was uh, 12 people in the room, and there was um, and there was six different ideas from wind energy to to a, a, a bottled water company to a car wash, and a co you know worker co -op, co -op car wash, and uh, uh, you know and, and like I say, I mean, you know, so I had to tell them, I mean, uh, we can't this. We can't go forward with this. I mean, we have to. I mean, you, you're going to have to talk some more, and, and um, here's some ideas on how to help you do it. I mean, uh, you know, should we? You know, I, give, I gave them some uh, local facilitators to help them in the process, and say I'll be back at such and such point, and I hope uh, we've uh, winnowed it down to maybe one, maybe uh, or at least two. You know, and then we can then we can so start working further. But lots of times I'll yeah. meet once or twice with a group, and then I'll give them this page yeah. and say. When you have the answers to this question, you know, to, or at least the first two sections of this question, you know, this page, call me back. I'd love to come and talk with you about it. But it's hard for people to get clear because in order to choose this, you have to not choose all these other things. And nobody knows what's really going to work 
and so it's hard. But if they don't get focused, they will not be successful. You know, you can only do one thing well when you get started. So how, how, to, how to, you know, let go of all those other things. And um, the Connecticut Energy Co-op, when they started, there were 16 members of the board of directors. They wanted green electricity, conservation efficiency services, both for residential and commercial, um, photovoltaics installation, a heating oil cooperative, uh, purchasing cooperative, and there, was, there were five. I can't remember what the fifth one was. And that board of directors insisted that they needed all of those products and services because you had to have a package of products and services in order to attract members. And they signed on 13,000 people. I mean, it, households it was a magnificent feat. But it was too hard, you know, to do all of those products and services and negotiate all those contracts and blah, blah, blah. And they would have, they would have had an easier time had they picked one and done that really well and taken the 6,000 people who wanted that one and then added on as they kind of stabilized and, and they're not in business anymore. And that's only one of the reasons why they're not in business. But um, yes, so first things first. So the strategic planning process is where you create a shared business, a shared vision for the business, where you craft a viable business strategy. So you say, this is how we want the world to be di different because this business exists, and this is how we're going to go about making that happen. And you understand the best practices in group-based business development and build a development plan for your business. So on the next couple of pages, we gave you uh, keys to successful co-op development. Project starts with, and these are handouts that I give to groups who are thinking about it. Project starts with a compelling need, a strong champion, a clear vision. People find these, you know, these are kind of common sense, but they find them very grounding when they're getting started. And it's a good checklist to go back to a couple times and say, you know, how are we doing? Yeah, Do we, we have, have three or four uh, greatly? I mean, you got a champion, you got the compelling vision, and then, but then, you know, a couple other, I mean, really key things are just not there. I mean, so at least I'm giving them that checklist, then they can begin to, it helps in that conversation of, 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 yeah. of, of, of are we really ready to launch it, or you know, do we need more time to vision and discuss and plan. The, the back side of that first page, the second page, is um, the different roles in the development process. And these are the roles as we see them in the way we do co-op development at the Cooperative Development Institute. There are other ways to parse this out. But these, the, we just find it helpful to, and I would say none of our projects do this exactly. You know, it's always a conversation. Like, how about we do this and you do that? Oh, you want to do that too? That's great. OK, then we'll do this. But coming to um, a clear understanding of who's doing what helps. Uh, it took us a while to figure out all the things we needed to clarify. But um, so if we start with this and then edit it with each of the groups that we're working with, we find that pretty helpful. And particularly, uh, like you said, as seeing yourself, for example, like you know, if, if you know, as, as say a group of uh, grad students going to work with a community organization, you know, having clear sense of what is your role in that. I mean, and and what are the responsibilities you're going to take on, and what are you not going to take on? You know, and and and, and uh, with the uh, uh, sitting down with the champion, you know, that maybe that one or two or three people that really excited about this and really want to make this happen, you know, and, and coming together with some kind of clear sense with them on what, on what those expectations are. It can save you a lot of problems in, in the, um, you know, as, as, you, as you move along. I mean, if, uh, I've, I've seen some just um, ugly scenes kind of develop, uh, you know, that, that started out well, but then there, there was, you know, they had uh, just a lot of just unreasonable expectations uh, um, um, on e either side. And so like, having that conversation, you know, and like I said, having something like this that also has the credibility of, you know, that it's been tested and worked in, in a number of different situations also helps in terms of uh, having that, um, um, you know, beginning to negotiate out uh, uh, those understandings of roles. Yeah, having a, mm -hmm. um, we used to do a, um, um, like a formal agreement, Yes. We often put this in an MOU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then this, this next set of pages, this chart, is my favorite. If I could only have one, I'd keep this one. <laughs> <laughs> 
but it, it, um, it's just a really great worksheet. By the time I work through this with people, they have an idea of what it's going to take to get their business started, and we keep checking in on it. Okay? Um, how much did that actually cost us? You know, who was going to do that? Did they follow through? Um, are we getting it done by the time we said we were going to? Um, you know, we, we haven't done member development, and it's six months later. You know, the, what we said we were going to do in stage one. What does that mean about our organizing work, and who's doing it, and do we need to get some more people on there, and what's up with that? But this, um, this is kind of the, 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 the blueprint for how the process moves forward, and just, again, just filling it out. Um, I usually do this the second or third time I meet with people when we have kind of an idea of what it is they're going to do. And people leave so excited because it's tangible what the end result's going to look like. But it's also sobering also because, I mean, that, that you can, and you know, and particularly when you're dealing with folks that may have had no business experience at all, you know, the thought that, you know, oh, we can, three months, we'll knock this out, you know, we'll vision, we would have done the business plan, feasibility studies, uh, you know, structured the board and, you know, and we got a product and we're hitting the streets, you know. No, I mean, I'm not unless I'm, you know, and getting folks to see that it's a much more uh, larger commitment of time and effort, uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, that there, there may be a lot, you know, a lot of shortcuts that may happen depending on what, what uh, assets people already have in place, but at least giving them a sense of this is what generally how long it takes. So, it, you know, it, it sobers them, give them a sense that we're not, this is not going to be done, you know, in, in, a, in a half a year that, that, that we're really talking about one, two, three years of uh, work to really get this uh, uh, business up and running. Uh, so, yep. And, and then we've got the group based planning overview. So, when it's business planning overview, so when it's time to actually, they've got a shared vision, they've got a development plan, we've got the money raised to pay for the development process. This um, gives a good overview of what happens in a business planning process. Um, and again, this is something that we can, you can hand out to people and it's, it's, um, it's accessible. And then, it, yeah, and they, the, the rest of this packet up until the end is um, there's a workbook for, um, for doing market analysis. Who are the customers and how can we design what we're doing to fit who they are? And it's a great workbook. I've used it with a lot of groups. And it, it, if you have any ideas for a business and you want to kind of get go from the very surface down a few inches to see whether it could work and what could really work and how you might really do it. It's a great first step in the business planning process. And then there's, a fee there's some feasibility resources to see um, once you know you've got a good idea and there's a market for it, or you have a good idea that you have a market for it, the next step is to check it out financially. You know, is it feasible? Um, and you do a little bit more research, and you might have two or three business models that you're checking out. Would it be better for us to do this, or this, or this? And you want to compare those. The best feasibility studies I've seen do that. They don't just take one model and prove it. They take one or two variations on that model and see which one would be the most effective way to implement that business. Um, so the, res the next set of resources are from colleagues of mine in, in the Midwest who um, put together, actually it's a, a the colleagues wrote it, but it's a national co-op resource on how to do feasibility studies. Um, put out by the Clusa Institute, which actually works internationally uh, a lot in India and Africa. Um, and then the last one is just an outline for a, bus for a business plan from SBA. And I never use outlines for a business plan. I always say, what is it that this group needs to know in order to really successfully implement this business? But it's nice to have those, I those, the outline there to kind of give a check, you know, kind of say, well, do I need to say anything more about business operations or governance or whatever in case you've neglected to put that down? But it's, um, I find short business plans are the best. And um, the, the reason, well, what, this is a lot of planning. Planners love it. A lot of community people want to start the business. You've, you've all been out in the world long enough. What happens when community folks just start a business? What's the result of skipping this planning part? Um, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it doesn't it doesn't go very far. I find that there's no way everybody has the same idea about how that business is going to get implemented. Not, there's not even a chance. There's not a prayer of a chance. So if you've got three people in the room and they're going to start a business together and they haven't done any planning, they're all going to go off in different directions. And instead of working it out ahead of time, you're going to be working it out while you're spending money. And you know your cash is depleted and you haven't had time to solve the problem before. You, you, know, you didn't even know you had a problem and it's already closed the business down because you haven't had a chance to work it through. You've, you've targeted the wrong product to the wrong market. You're, you know, you're trying to deliver it in the wrong way. There's, if you go through the business planning process, you can vet a whole lot of problems before they bite the business. And so um, it's, it's just good, sound um, way to start any business. But if you want to start a group-based business, there are no shortcuts. Because you've got a group of people who want to share decision making, and the only way to share decision making is to plan. And like I said, once you, this is your roadmap. Um, it's not something to, to produce and then put on the shelf. That this is something that, like, in that catering, I mean, that you, they'd have a clear sense of what are the financial projections that they need, uh, you know, uh, on a month by month basis for the next three years or whatever. And uh, uh, you know, so uh, that would dictate, the, you know, the, uh, how they moved. Uh, you know, understanding what your, your competitors are and all those other things. I mean, just that process of being able to talk it out and you know, and then for me, I, you know, like, I've always we can you know periodically get back to it and look again and make sure that that is is still um, uh, valid and you know maybe there needs there's some new st stuff that got thrown in the game there's a new competitor and you know the, uh, the market's changed in some significant way and you know it gives you a, a process to be able to look at it come to, and like I said and come to some unified uh, decision making on it and uh, it's but it's I think it's 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 just time really well spent um, I mean, so, uh, but I, I agree with I mean if you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, you know. A lot of times you can get these telephone book size <laughs> business plans. I mean, uh, uh, I think that the, you know, it, it's it's not necessary to have that size, but um, at least a, a lot of the key questions have to be uh, dealt with. So the the next thing we're going to do is um, engage in this role play, and I've given you each a different card, except the two of you have the same card. All right, and um, so if you could um, take a minute to read your card, and then when you're ready, introduce yourself to the group so people know. All you have to just say is which role you're playing. And it, it would be good not to um, actually tell anybody else what's on your card. Just act it through. So if the grad students could convene, that would be good. Say that again. So if the, if the grad students could serve as the facilitators for this role play, that would be good. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that was a good thing to start with. <laughs> um, well, thanks for coming, everybody, to the meeting. Um, can everybody go around and introduce themselves? Do you want to go first? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, I am a, a no-name graduate student at <laughs> no Name University. Uh, and uh, we are here to uh, talk about this uh, grocery store. I look forward to working with you. Okay, I'm going to And actually, before you start, I'm going to ask you to the two of you to take this, those two seats over there. It'll just be more fun for the videotape. Fun, fun, fun. And if the if you guys could just all move down just a little bit, Kalia, you can sit. Yeah, that's great.
And the microphone's here in the middle of the table, if you could speak to that. Still me? No, oh, OK. okay. <laughs> no, okay. Um, hi, I'm Solana. I'm representing Community A. I'm interested in making this grocery store happen, because I think it'll bring a lot of good things to the neighborhood. So you're representing Community A? Yes. Okay. Well, you're a community member. I'm yes. Yes. Oh. Um, you're the chair of this community okay. group. I'm the chair of this community group, and um, I run a catering business um, here in the community, and um, I'm just here to support the effort of getting this grocery store. I'm a uh, community bay, and <clears throat> I think there ought to be a grocery store, but one that really works and one that really happens. And I don't think this is a safe neighborhood. I think that's one of the first issues that has to be addressed. And I think we I think we need to have experienced business people running this store. So I'm chairing the meeting. Um, Okay, well, I guess. Well, I think that the graduate students. The are graduate students are here. They're, yeah, they're so here to facilitate this. I was going to say, perhaps event. we could hear from our young graduate students. Oh, but... okay, no, <laughs> Well, um, we've uh, uh, done um, a little bit of research, and, and which is why which is why we are here, and uh, you know, we just talk about the issues of, uh, of basically uh, food access in the cities and the fact that there isn't a a viable grocery store uh, you know, in this community and people have to drive out of the community uh, just to, in order to access food and uh, so many people in this area just don't, have, don't even own cars, their own personal transportation to be able to access food. So we're trying to look at uh, possible uh, um, alternative um, ideas. Uh, one, of, you know, one was uh, transportation cooperatives, but I think this idea of the grocery store actually in this community you know, would allow you know, just local, local assets and allow these resources to maintain here, to be maintained here in this community to allow some building to go on here. And um, yeah, and so, you know, we're just trying to, you know, just to get together with uh, local, local community people to see, you know, how we can uh, begin to initiate this process and just to start a dialogue in this world. Yes, um, young, no name. Um, <laughs> when you first came to me a few weeks ago with this idea for your class project, um, you, you talked about this idea of a cooperatively owned supermarket, and I, I'm just not really sure what you mean by that, and I'm, I'm not sure if that is gonna happen, I guess, is my concern. Mm. So, I, I'd like to see the store here. I'd like to support your ideas. I think it's interesting. Mm. Um, we do wanna keep assets in our community. Um, so I'm just, you know, I'm just wondering how you see this, this planning process playing out. Well, no offense to Mr. Monday, but we we live here in this neighborhood. Uh, Mr. No Name and his fellow students don't live here. They're just here for some course assignment to get a grade. And at the end of the day, we're going to be stuck with whatever gets put up here. And Mr. No Name said that his group did a little bit of research and that's my problem. You know, we need more than a little bit of research and we don't, this isn't a research project, this is a grocery store. And we want quality groceries in here and that takes more than a little bit of research to figure out because we haven't had it here in 20 years, so. But it seems to me that there's a lot of effort and energy going towards this. I mean, I think that the research will help and I'm sure that the graduate students will do more as they get more invested in the place. But I think there are also people here in the community that are willing to put forth the energy and um, the effort to push it through to fruition. Well, there's a lot of energy in the riots in the 60s. You probably don't remember that. <laughs> but it didn't mean this anything got built. So, I mean, I, I welcome your energy, but, you know, I think we need to have something serious that's going to work here. And that's not something you can do for your course, and you know, 
in a few months' time and leave. And it's not something that you can ask people in this neighborhood to put their money up for when they don't know it's going to work, because they can't afford for it to fail. Well, um, in terms of the uh, amount of research, uh, you know, we just tried to do, uh, you know, just um, a very small study, just to start off with. It wasn't even so much of a study, um, but we did put, put a lot of work and effort. Uh, we actually went door to door uh, with the survey and talked to people about, you know, their issues of accessing, accessing food and how far they had to drive to get to the grocery store, how long it took them, and, um, and just to talk with them about um, the different options that they you know, would consider uh, to be viable options, and and the majority of the residents in the community who we talked to, um, you know, were open to it and, and were pretty excited about the idea of actually owning their own store. And um, you're exactly right that you know I don't live in this community, um, and this is a, you know a project that we're doing through school. But I see it I see it as as an opportunity, and it's, and it's a great course, um, you know, that is allowing me. You know, to venture out into a community and actually work with communities and do this type of work, you know, through course, through, through class, which is why I'm studying in the first place, because uh, I would like just to continue with this type of work throughout my career. Um, but you know, so acknowledging that you know we won't be here very long, uh, which is why we think the cooperative model is such an advantageous model for the community because it's one that the community will own it and the community will control. Now, um, you know, different models of development would try to, you know, get, you know, an Albertsons or a Kroger or some someone else to come into your community, which is not a, a grocery store that you own, but it's privately owned. And so, and once they come into the community, you're stuck with them, and you don't own them. You know, they pretty much, you know, bring whatever food that they get to come into this neighborhood. And as you said, you know, the perceptions outside of this neighborhood is that it's unsafe, it's violent, it's drug infested. So, you know, people, you know honestly are less concerned about the types of food and the quality of food that you get. But in a, in a grocery store that you own and that you control as residents and as members of this cooperative, you can contract with, you know, farmers that you know, you know, people, you know, to bring in the food that you like. So, you know, I think this, this could be a, a very good idea. So, you know, I understand your concerns and I think it's very much needed, you know, to have, you know, a very critical view and for us to kind of step slowly in this process. Um, but, you know, just give it a chance. We're also interested in leveraging resources to continue the process so that whether or not he and I are still players in it, that you're still connected with resources that enable the process to move forward with, you know, with more technical assistance and other key community players. So it's not, we're not here just to pitch it and leave. We are interested in enabling the process to move forward. Look, the fact of the matter is, you're right about there's energy behind it now. But the city's put up a million dollar loan. We, 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 we just want to know when we're going to look out our window and see a supermarket there. Uh, I mean, the mo the money's there, but I don't know, like, what is what does it cost? And and I don't I don't know about this cooperative thing. Like, I just want to I just want to be able to supply my catering business and walk to the store. And you know, I got my own problems. So I just I just the, you know, the city's put up a million dollars. When is there going to be a supermarket on the corner? You know, maybe I'm the oldest person here, but <laughs> I remember the federal government put up all millions of dollars for small black businesses, and that money just, nobody exactly knows where the money went. Mm -hmm. But the businesses aren't here anymore, and I just have two questions. What's, what's going to stop folks from robbing your store blind? How are you going to prevent that? I don't see how you're not going to have the same problem the other supermarket's gonna have unless we have a new police station down here. What's your plan on that? Number two, how are you gonna get, if people in this neighborhood are gonna put their own money into it, I don't care about what the city's gonna put into it. What are people in this neighborhood gonna put into it? See, these people here will tell you they'll fly to the moon. You, you send them out a survey, they say, yeah, we'll go to the moon. Now you ask them to put $200 for their ticket to go to the moon, then they're not going to the moon anymore. They're gonna stay right where they are. So my question for you is, how are you going to get them to put their money where their mouth is? Because I know these people here. Well, the question on how to get uh, the community and the people involved, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, we, as being outsiders in this community, would have to rely more on you. 
and because you are the leadership in this community. And, uh, you know, so we would actually have to, uh, um, you know, uh, refer or defer that charge to you, uh, you know, as far as, you know, attempting to organize this community. But, you know, in terms of um, the viability, <laughs> in terms of, in terms of, in terms of the viability, uh, we are uh, prepared and we are, um, you know, uh, uh, how you say, uh, organizing ourselves and, and we're, you know, getting ourselves uh, ready to, to assist you in doing, you know, business strategy modeling, uh, feasibility assessments, uh, capitalization assessments, to really do more of the type of studies that, that, that you feel that we need in order to assess, you know, the viability and the sustainability of the store. Now, in terms of, you know, the safety, um, you know, I think that there are multiple ways to deal with that. I think there are positive ways and there are uh, punitive and negative ways. I think more police are getting a new police station as an actual punitive or negative you know, reinforcement to trying to deal with that type of situation. And I would personally, but this is not my community, it's up to you, but, but my personal you know, uh, um, choice or my personal um, ideas would be to look for a more positive uh, methods of dealing with violence, of, of, of dealing with, you know, some of the root causes to, you know, these types of crimes in any community, you know, and so, you know, just adding more police to a neighborhood, you know, um, the, you know, the city where I'm from, we have more police per capita than any other city in the country, but crime is on the rise, murder rate is on the rise, so, you know, it just doesn't really, you know what I'm saying? So I think that there are much deeper issues that need to be involved, and I think, you know, organizing a community around this cooperative idea, but getting a community organized and mobilized can can then lead to that possibility of addressing these various other issues that, that are involved because it's because the power is is within this community to address its own needs. Well, I would pose: are, are, there, are there different ways of thinking about this? I mean, why wouldn't we just say Albertsons come in mm -hmm. and? Albertson's we have got everything I need to run my catering company. I'll tell you that right now. My sister-in-law down in the next county over, she's shopping there. Sometimes when I go pick up the kids, I just go there and go shopping because I, I need everything I need, and I need it in bulk, and they need it all at once. So I don't know what this cooperative supermarket, they're going to have everything I need, and then when is it, and how long is it going to take? Um, it, may, it, may take, it may take a little while to together, but I think one of the benefits of it is that there will, because it will be owned by people here, they can guarantee a certain permanence to it, whereas Albertsons may pick up and go um, and move somewhere further away. And although you might have a car and be able to get there, there are a lot of people who don't have access to it here, and so there is a pretty significant community need, and so there would it would be theoretically more sustainable here, which would benefit you in the long term. Right. And also, um, just through, just if you um, just assess the uh, shipping methods and the uh, procurement methods of, of a large store, like, large store like Albertsons, you know, they pull groceries from God knows where. You know, they ship it; it's full of all types of chemicals and pesticides and preservatives to keep it fresh because they're shipping it from God knows where. I think, you know, um, in our idea of this cooperative, you know, there are there are tons, literally tons, many uh, local small farmers, medium-sized farmers, you know, right outside of this community, you know, in, 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 in these rural er areas, we could be accessible and getting um, lo lo locally grown, fresh produce delivered to the store daily, you know, and, you know, always doing it in bulk, you know, you, 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 you may reduce prices on one end in bulk, but you also, you know, create the risk of reducing quality when you're doing it that way. And I think, you know, this, just the system of, you know, us building this model here, but supporting, you know, rural farmers who, you know, are right next to us, who aren't getting, the, you know, the support that they need. You know, I think it just builds just, uh, just a deeper system of uh, solidarity. And I think, you know, also, I think, you know, the value that, that your catering business will, will get from supporting a local industry, from, 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 from going into a store, of residents, of, of people within your community, I think you know the value that that you get as a uh, catering business. You know, seeing seeing that process going on, I think you know people you know may come may come to recognize your business more. You know, and you make it more activity because so I'm going to do a time for just a minute. I'm just to redirect. <laughs> I'm going to redirect for just a second. Um, it's been great. Great. I mean, how many people have been in community where you have these kinds of conversations? I mean, this is like regular, typical. 
why starting group-based businesses is so hard. Um, what I'd like to ask the two of you to do is to um, say that come from the position where you don't know what the end result is going to be, but what you're interested in doing is helping them decide what they want to do. So rather than defending that position, tell them, well, you know, we're here just to give you information. What other information do you need? And here's our strategic planning, you know, list of questions, and let's let's try to get onto that. So try that for a minute and see how that. Albertsons, let's look at Albertsons. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so just see if you can see if you can do. S <laughs> see if you can do something to build um, an agreement about what the next, you know, how to get started on the next step so that they can have the information they need to decide what's best for them. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not actually a grad student, so it's <laughs> and then you got a very strong opposition here. I mean, uh, yeah. Phil is uh, like he summed up all the, uh, the the conservative opposition. <laughs> 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 So my first question to the uh, three of you would be, you know, what would be your vision of how not only, you know, this, this co-op, but just this issue of, of, of getting, you know, greater, greater access to food uh, in this community, how, can, how, how do you think that could best be solved? What does that look like, you know, whether it be a cooperative store, whether it be an Albertsons, whether it be, um, you know, um, delivery, Cooperatives to get people, you know, food or to get people transport outside. You know, we, we consider many different options. But what for you is would be the best option? I would just like there to be food that I want, <laughs> um, not crazy stuff, but like meat and potatoes. Simple, but also having a place where kids can get jobs. And there just isn't a lot of opportunity for that. Here. Um, so I don't know if the community owned route is the best way to get to that. Um, will that mean more jobs, less jobs? I don't need an option. The city's going to build a police station. The police station gets built. Albertsons is going to come here. We're going to have a grocery store. That's right here and now. That's on the tape. I don't know. Well, you're talking about options because this community is not organized right now well, for I some mean, option. By the time we're done talking, you know, I don't have too many much more years left here, you know, and I just want to buy something before I'm gone. <laughs> well, I don't know what you're saying, the community is not organized. We got over 200 people coming out for these planning meetings. I think we got the numbers, we got the people, we are organized contrary to Sir Thompson's beliefs, but <laughs> we we need to see something happen, and I agree with you on that. Um, so we got the numbers, we got people there here at the table, but I think we don't know how to get from here to here. We know the city's putting up money, we know safety is an issue in our community, but we we want to know when we're going to wake up and see a grocery store on the corner. And whatever process you have, that's going to lead us to that point, you know, quicker. I'm, I'm going to get behind that. Now we're going to jump forward six months. Would you like to have, we'll keep you in your same role. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. A. No, wait. No, sorry, sorry, would you pass that to the grad student, please? <laughs> grad student, community B. You're doing such a great job. We have to have you continue in that role. I <laughs> have the chair Thank you. and community A. <laughs> you? So it's six months later, and not a lot more has happened. Sure. 
Um, so, having completed all of the feasibility study and the market research, we are actually able to get this um, grocery store up and running, um, and we need to get, what is it? Um, Um, so, but in order to, according to the business plan, we're going to need to get 500 members um, to join, each for $25. And so, we're here now to plan the membership drive. How are we going to get 500 people um, to sign on for this? We've gone door to door already. We know that people are interested. But we've got to get the buy-in now. So. Um, oh, and the other, the other thing that happened in the six months is the business planning happened, and the group did vote to adopt the business plan and, and build the store, the despite the cooperative store, despite some um, minority uh, opposition. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. yes. So what are you talking about now, honey? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, hold on. Sorry, I gotta read my card. <laughs> uh, well, according to the to the market research and the feasibility study, this this store can work. This store can hold water in the city, and it resonates with community members here. Um, people are really interested in doing it. In order to make it work, that we're going to need 500 people to buy in, um, 25 bucks a piece. Um, so what we need to do now is strategize the membership drive to get people to buy into it. Um, Yes, um, <laughs> um, yeah, we've been, uh, again, doing our door-to-door uh, -door campaign to try to get members to sign up. And, uh, you know, um, when we uh, first, first began to meet uh, six months ago, you mentioned that, that, you, that, that you had, that we had about 200, 250 people uh, coming out to these meetings. And that's about half of what we need um, just to, uh, you know, get, get signed up. But we had 200 people coming to these meetings, but people are sick and tired of coming to these meetings and nothing gets done and we just argue about this and that. and. We don't, you know, we don't have, we don't have to, 200, we got 200 people that want to see a grocery store. We don't have 200 people that want to come to meetings all the time. Well, <clears throat> I hear you. And um, I think, you know, but right now, you know, we're, we're, we're at the point where, you know, once we get the um, initial investment, we can actually begin, begin building. And I think, you know, the, I think that the community will begin to see results, you know, very, very soon. Well, you know, I think, School's almost over, and it's time for you all to go home and get your A. You got an A for talking, but now it's money time. We're talking about people's money putting on the table. And the city has been here. They're ready to build this police station. They like it. They want to do it here. We can have Albertsons come in here. We've been sitting here for six months now. and. It's time for this foolishness to stop. And we just need to move on, let them build this here police station, get some, get some police here, get some supermarkets so the old folks can shop, and we can stop all this nonsense going on here. And you don't have, just because you had a, a, few a few people from here voting on this thing, there are more people out in that community, they didn't vote on anything. And these people voting here doesn't mean a thing, because you haven't collected that money. And you're not going to collect that money. That's a lot, sir. This is just going nowhere <laughs> fast. <laughs> I'm just hoping that we can come to some sort of organization understanding what these 200 people are, are still coming here for. Like, of course, we all want to see a grocery store, but it might be really hard for them. These people to are coming here because TVs are reruns. <laughs> That's why they're coming here. <laughs> well, I think. I mean, I think there should be some sort of collective voice. I mean, can't we can't we figure out a way to have a board or something like a board of directors to sort of look guide every the CDC in this neighborhood has a board of directors. They haven't got nothing done. It, all it does is waste people's time. They spend all this time trying to deal with people's personalities and this person, this person. God, they know this person. They're on the board of directors. I am not wasting my time with a sense of board of directors. We just need to make a decision. We just need to move forward. I think people could come out and argue at these meetings. It's not getting nothing done. Right. I um, completely agree because we we came to agreement that we wanted to go ahead and try to get the store up and running. You know, we did the feasibility study, came back very positive. Um, you know, we looked at the numbers of people who, who would be hired, um, and being that it, it is a community-owned store, being that you know 80% of the profits are not going to go 
to hours in the central, someplace wherever that is, you know, that but that all the profits, all the revenue from the store will stay within this community. You know, we can, you know, we we, we also found that we can pay, you know, um, uh, 15, 20 percent higher uh, average salary to the workers in the store that Albertsons would pay. Uh, not to mention, you know, the turnover rate at these Albertsons supermarkets. They bring these little high school kids in there, working to death, you know, they fund out of school and they fire them, and they bring someone else in because they get a tax uh, a, a tax write off to hire kids from these poor, disturbed communities. You know, so that, that, that's how that's how that whole thing works. So, but you know, we're but we're ready to go. Um, <clears throat> You know, um, right now what we need is just this initial investment money to get the thing in the ground. We have the developer, he's ready, you know, they're ready to sign the contract. It's a local business, you know, just ready to get the store built to do the renovations. You know, the, the structure of the building is actually sound. We just need to do the internal renovations, you know, you know, get, you know, business plan together, the name of the store even, you know, and just get that together. And we are ready to go. Uh, you know, we've talked to a number of farmers who are ready to contract with us to, to supply the grocery store fresh produce. You know, we've talked to different, you know, you know we, we, we've done market research in the community to find out what types of processed goods people, you know, would like to have in the store, you know, from macaroni and cheese, you know, those types of things, you know, soft drinks, you know, bottled water, these types of things. We, we're ready to go. You know, we just Excuse me, we who? Excuse me? Who's we? Um, our Who's we? research see, see, you're a student. You're not, you are going. You ready to go because semester's over. You go. Now, this, this, is, this is what I'm saying right here. You're ready to go. You can go on. You did say we're, we're not going anywhere. And and if I had a dollar for all this foolishness, every hour this foolishness you've been talking in here, I'd be able to build my own supermarket. Well, I wonder okay. when you're going to so, go ask that university for the investment money. They always send in students down here to do feasibility studies. and. It's such a small amount of money. Why don't you go back to the university and see if they'll put up some money? I'm not Don't get smart with me. I'll pay them. Well, you said something really interesting earlier about all the 200 people who didn't vote in this, and those are the people who I think we need to go talk to about whether they'd be interested in getting involved in this and maybe buying in, because I think there is a large there are a lot of people who aren't involved in this who aren't going anywhere, but would maybe be interested in this, and so we still need to go talk to them. And so, well, once we start talking to all those people, we're never going to get anything done here. You want to pull 200 more people in who aren't even interested in this, and we can't even get anything done with 20 people here. But that's why, if we had, I'm going to call Tom. <laughs> Give yourself a round of applause. That was magnificent. <laughs> um, this store did not get built. It had the money. It had the business plan. It had most, the great majority of the people in the community that wanted to do it, and it didn't get built. Um, but what was it like to be to be in this? Um, Very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's like, oh, this town. the only one who had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just was in the I, I'm always in the other seat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty relaxing just to come in and just get to say no every single time. You know what's going to happen. But like I said, as, as a, a, this point of one, you know, of having clear roles, and you know, and 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 and, uh, and being able to, uh, instead of because uh, that was one of the things that happened, where the, the grad students became, we were going to be the defenders of the uh, cooperatives with two or three other uh, community people, and then you had the folks that were opposed. Instead of like, let's, you know, these are, are all questions that that should be. Uh, Answered in the strategic planning. You know, we have some ideas toward it. Um, you know, but but uh, uh, as well as many other members in this room. But we're going to all get sit down, help you sit down together, and uh, and come up with a plan that you will implement. That that you will that will be your plan. This is not our. You know, I mean, our job is to. You know, we're we're just providing you tech assist. But you know, being clear that that this is uh, the our market is the hour is y'all. You know, not, and and then we're just. A, assisting you to, you know, in getting that process and having a clear understanding on that, you know, and then using good negotiating skills, like I said, so, so that, because uh, um, uh, on some of those uh, things that, uh, for example, like the issues of security that 
you know, that, that uh, you know, there were important kernels of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of things that needed to be dealt with, you know, so, you know, the, uh, not dismissing them, even though they may have been colored with a, you know, a, a, a more conservative approach than we may have wanted to say, but figuring out, okay, how can we answer those questions in a, in a strategic planning process that you will control? And, 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 um, and, and you know, like I said, and, and doing that, and then, you know, then bringing, making sure that new people are being brought to the table, that uh, um, making sure that, uh, uh, you know, that, you know that, that this process of structure and other things are uh, addressed, you know, not as a, a battle between the uh, uh, grad students from outside, outside the community and, uh, and the community, but, but uh, a, a discussion about what things work, um, uh, paying attention to uh, replicable model, uh, models, um, feasible models, and being able to say this is not something I just read about it in the book, but being able to, you know, you know, uh, maybe you know, uh, other folks have um, you know, like brought folks. You know, you know, uh, uh, you know, Chicago and Southside. They got a great supermarket. You know, cooperative supermarket. Been around for a gazillion years. Runs as good as any of the other chains. You know, so you know, and in different situations, we brought the, 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 those leaders in there and say, look, you know, community people, and said, look, yeah, we get better service than any of the chains. And the, you know, and and it, just because it says co-op on it, that doesn't mean it's you know, it's some little hippy dippy thing in a in a in a in a in a, in a dirty room somewhere. <laughs> you know, so 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 I mean, so again, I mean, making sure you have uh, some strong, uh, some serious clarity on the roles, and uh, um, you know, and making sure that we don't step beyond our 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 role as as technical assistance providers and the sisters, you know, and, and that our our key job is to empower you. To make the most, the best, most informed uh, uh, decision that you can about about your future and about your community. But we set you guys up to yeah. be the advocates for the right. co-op, yeah, so, so we we definitely, you know, we fed you that in the first yeah. card. So, um, at Fox, what was it like? How did you like being in your role? It was so uh, familiar, <laughs> you know. I I mean, I, I it's, it's just so I've heard this arguments so many times, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like it's a classic common thing that comes up all the time. There's always somebody in a meeting who's, who's going to raise all this stuff, and, you know, always. You know. And how about the other community person? How'd you feel sitting in your place? I was I was kind of in between, so I like understood where Phil was coming from, but I wanted to. I was hopeful that we could figure out something else, like an alternative. But I, I had no, I had nothing else but the ability to come to meetings. <laughs> so um, I couldn't say, well, there is this model in Chicago, and and we can make demands on Albertsons if that's really what we want, or. Um, no, we do have the capacity to run a co-op because it was just so unfamiliar to me. So we could advocate one way or the other. Uh, besides, well, there's another way besides Albert Simpson Police Station. Some more information would have been helpful to you. Right. Yeah. And all too often, that's a, usually a, a sizable a chunk of folk that's just Most of caught in the middle, the want to see something positive, you know, <laughs> don't want to be negative, you know, wants, you know, want to unify, but but don't have all the information they need to be able to, to be a stronger voice. You know, and so then, yeah. 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 I would have just shrunk. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. That, so as Shakur was saying, yeah. site visits to other places, some reading, uh, guests coming in to say mm -hmm. we've done it before, this is how we did it, all of those kinds of things really support those members who really want to see something happen but need education mm -hmm. in order to be able to really participate in that planning process. Mm -hmm. And how about Ch Ms. Chair? Mm -hmm. How was your role? I never really took on the chair role, but I mean, I was sort of supposed to be chairing the meeting. You know, at first I was kind of like, okay, whatever, but then I was sick of the students and then <laughs> I just wanted to actually those numbers had shrunk so much, which was the last thing I said before he switched us, was I was like, we've got numbers, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Then we had no numbers and he was right. And um, <laughs> and then I just wanted people to stop coming to the meetings because then I thought maybe something could, could get done, which is just such a weird thing that also happened like in the community. And then 
like the whole board of directors thing and the thing and the numbers and like so you don't really want people to come to the meeting because you just want to get things done but up here like you have some kind of process of consensus so um but I didn't I just felt like I didn't really have anything to like I was just annoyed but I didn't have anything to push or ask I didn't even know what to ask for from them like I was just sick of them and when he was saying for them to go on like I was like fine go on but I was feeling like you never want to be in a position where like I don't know if that's like negotiating skills like if Khalil could have been like we're only here as long as you want us to be here and then I mean he could have gotten in a position where you were like you're done go home but rather than like we're here to push this agenda but like we're only here I don't know but I just felt like I had nothing to like I had no I was so, sort of the chair but I had no I was not a chair in our role play at all and I had no like yeah it, 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 a lot of like, chairs function in that capacity. <laughs> and so really good facilitation for the minority community person who was really against the project would have been very useful. But most chairs don't have those skills. Yeah, because there was nothing in my They don't know how to do it. It said that my role was a chair, but there was nothing in my card that said that I was supposed to like convene or do run the meeting in any way. So I didn't really feel like that was what I was supposed to do at all. Yeah. Like I, and I kind of knew where he was coming from, so I was like, yeah. And again, we, we set you up for one of yes. the classic roles in these community groups where the chair doesn't have the skills, doesn't have training, is sometimes facilitating meetings with hundreds of people there, and is, you know, yeah. never done it before, and doesn't know how to make an agenda, keep an agenda, make sure that the group is moving forward on its agenda and what's most important to it, and not allowing minority voices to actually take over and um, sideswipe you know the intention of the whole group and with a good facilitator you can keep on the vision yes you know mr thomas we've we've heard you and um you know we're we're going to move forward you know um thank you very much for expressing your opinion and the decision of the group is to move in this direction and we're glad that you're still joining us but uh yeah, but it, again, more education is needed to really build the leadership capacity of that chair to, you know, be able to pull it's it a, off. It's a, like I said, a tremendously difficult position, and that, that that person, I mean, it was wanted to make it work, you had, you know, but then didn't feel it was necessary, and then a lot of times you get in the position where then they start to strike out, you know, I mean, then they get defensive, and then they, you know, and then they get, you know, and uh, you know, and, and become combative, you know, because that's all they know how to do at that point, you know. So I mean, again, I mean, putting them in a situation where they can learn those skills uh, um, and 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 become stronger chairs, uh, uh, you know, as well as looking for new new leaders like uh, a community A, you know, I mean, uh, or, you know, uh, so that that um, so that those uh, you can for, form a leadership core and not just you know one leader, you know, and begin to build a you know a group of folk that, that uh, will stand up for democracy and, 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 and focusing the vision and moving it forward. And how about grad students? We set you up in the hardest role. Yeah. yeah. It didn't feel so good. No. <laughs> well, the, I think trying to just sort of thinking of, I knew, I knew we were chairs, but sort of trying to facilitate at the same time that we're pushing, pushing that we shouldn't have actually been pushing as aggressively, I think, as we were. But we, we set you up. For yeah, that too. <laughs> um, so that was just really that was really awkward, um, and so I think that it, it just highlighted for me the need for a really quality facilitation in these meetings, um, and, and a clear sense of role. And a clear sense of role. Yeah, I, yeah, I felt that was a little bit. Right. I'll say the same thing because, like, with us, like I would never want to go into a community and chair the meeting. Um, you know, that, that just it didn't feel right. And then also, um, uh, it just seemed like, uh, you know, they were, you know, skeptical, you know, about the whole thing. And so I was like, well, you know. Why are you here? Together, you know, <laughs> Where at the know, well, look, you know, we, you know I, I, I really wanted to say, well, look, you know, you, you know we'll come back and y'all figure it out, you know, because you know, I don't know, you know. But I felt like, you know, okay, we're here, and you know, the card said we were supposed to do this. <laughs> so I just doing what the card told me. <laughs> but um, you know, so yeah, you know, it was just, it was just yeah, the whole thing. But I would have preferred to have, you know, to not have been a role of facilitator, <laughs> or chair of the meeting. Because also, I felt like as chair, like you know, we were supposed to be leading this, the initiative, and I was like, well, that's not who we're supposed to be. 
competitive, so that's why I got into this whole defensive thing about trying to get it forward, but you know, that's not what we're supposed to do. I think also so a lot of the things that we said to the grad students, like, are things that people think but they don't say in a meeting because they're respectful or whatever. So a lot of times those things don't get said. That's what people are thinking. Well, uh, <laughs> a lot that kind of things awesome. <laughs> Very bad things said in meetings. It's true, though. I, I find it much harder to be in meetings where those things aren't being said. Yeah, you know, I, I find it much harder to deal with, and, the, and that happens a lot. That's interesting. We only have a few minutes left. You all have hung in there very well. Um, I want to share with you a development plan, which I have to collect back from you. Um, this is from a project I'm working on right now. And this is the opposite extreme of a highly functional um, project where, oh, and this we're doing every two. Wow. Um, and uh, so if, I, I think it's, and, and um, this is the biodiesel business that I'm putting together. And we, um, this is not the beginning development plan. This is our current development plan. So we've already gone through the business planning process. But we had something that kind of looked like this for all the beginning business planning stages. But I, this format, I think, is just very powerful. Again, it's just really clear saying, what is it that we have to do? What are the activities? Who are the decision makers? And so we've hired our manager, so we've got the manager um, in as the decision making maker for a bunch of key things. What are the things the board's going to decide? And you'll notice on the second page those are the equity decisions, the decision to accept equity, decision to accept debt, and um, corporate identity issues. Those are the things the board said, but the board said they were comfortable delegating the rest of the things to the CD CEO within all of the established policies. And they have a um, you know, a set of policy, 10 policies that the CEO has to make these decisions within in addition to the budget. And um, then there's measurement criteria about when each of these things has to be done and what success looks like. And um, then on a monthly basis, the CEO has to check off in this last column, you know, whether this thing is on schedule, whether it's delayed, whether the criteria is met. And the only thing that makes it to the board meeting is when it's delayed. And then the board chooses whether or not to discuss it. So the board's in charge of its agenda. It sets the agenda based on its criteria. Um, so it's very much about member ownership and control, even though there's a tremendous amount is delegated to the CEO. So um, having this kind of a clear development plan is, main t is keeping the project on track, making sure that the members, what the members want is getting done. Um, as uh, through their board um, representatives and keeping the power relationship between the board of directors, which is representatives of the members, um, keeping them in charge of the CEO rather than the other way around. And this is a really high powered, incredibly talented guy, you know, and so we want to make sure that we are, we're in right relationship with him. And um, so t uh, this tool um, and tools like this are, I think, tremendously useful. And I think this is, uh, this is great work on that. Part of uh, Lynn and the other folks that have done the biodiesel, because this is a, a very um, diverse group, you know, low-income folk, other folk, I mean, uh, and, uh, and like I said, and being able to, you know, in a, in a fairly technical and difficult, uh, uh, complex uh, industry, uh, uh, usually that those are all the, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, factors that will lead the CEO and, and to be able to do Pretty damn much what he wants to do, you know, or, or she wants to do. I mean, so so to be able to to set up a, a process where you know where there's true member uh, uh, ownership and control of that, uh, and and being able to break down, you know, like I said, relatively complex um, items and 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 to, into things that, that that folks can handle and control. I mean, you know, I think it shows the potential. I mean, so it's uh, I, I mean, just really good work. And but like I said, and I think the kind of thing that we ought to that that we have to be about, you know, showing that that, you know, no matter what the community that that uh, uh, that they can uh, that they can take on those tasks and and, and be, you know, strong, um, um, uh, knowledgeable uh, 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 board members that control all the key aspects of the uh, of the process. In my former mm -hmm. role as a manager, mm -hmm. I mean. Um, 
one of the things I really resented about certain mm -hmm. advocacy groups was mm -hmm. when they would confront me with, we want X. <laughs> you, here is your, you either say yes or no. Yeah, yeah. And what I really wanted was to be able to have a conversation, right. informed yeah. conversation with, you know, yeah. the, the yeah. residents, you know, the clients, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we could, you know, make sense mm -hmm. and, and they could understand the complexity and this and that. Yeah. And, so you know, right. I found that a lot of advocates, like, didn't really do that kind of work with the residents. They, they just sort of wanted to win a victory, mm -hmm. you know, against management. You know, and anyhow, this was when I was wearing a management hat. I, I think it's really possible to have mm -hmm. good relationships with managers when you do have that component yeah. you were talking about. Mm -hmm. When you, you, you know, when the rest, when the clients really do learn the business, so mm -hmm. you're having a real conversation. Mm -hmm. And yet, expertise is respected. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. this was a this was a conversation that lasted. Well, this board is the most functional board I've ever worked with. Um, it, it lasted for six weeks, a lot of email back and forth, and then two, two different board meetings where we looked at it and then adopted it. And um, it, it, it's, it's, it, it leaves that they were willing to delegate the selection of the technology. I was surprised because it's really a big deal for this business, which technologies provider they choose to provide the equipment for making the biodiesel. But they said, he has a lot more expertise. He has a PhD in microbiology, mm -hmm. and he's already started up uh, you know, three other tech businesses, and he's ordered this kind of, kind of equipment before. We don't really know. So as long as he stays within this output, this budget, you know, this quality that we want our product, He's going to make the decision. So it's like the conversation all happened. And now everybody knows what their job is and what they're going to be involved in and how it's going to work. So this, this co-op, this actually is an LLC. The um, co-op power is the co-op that owns, that has a 51% ownership stake in this LLC because it needed um, outside capital. So it couldn't, they couldn't just keep it within the co-op. But that this co-op business you know, is able to own and control what it wants, and it's clear about what it wants and how it's going to measure that. So how, how did they come to the process of deciding that there were three steps under WBO contracts and three steps under biodiesel sales? Um, how are they able to evaluate it? Because, I, I mean, me looking at this knowing nothing about technology, would say, this looks great, but I have no idea if there's a key piece missing or and and there's there were there's other expertise at the table in terms of the business planner the CEO myself as the I'm the interim manager until the transition to the new manager takes place so that you know there are people at the table who've been doing a lot of that research and a lot of conversation and they the board added more things than we had thought of you know and changed some things around and said, you know, we're really not sure whether 85% is, you know, the right number, you know. So, and then they got to hear the new, the incoming CEO and me and the business planner talk about, well, this is why we picked 85%. It, you know, one of us wanted this, one of us. And so they got to listen to the reasoning behind it and educate themselves about what, you know, what was our thinking about that and then make their own decisions. So there's a lot of conversation about each of those pieces. And I think everybody came away kind of understanding, at a much deeper level anyway, but understanding a lot of what it's going to take to actually put this business on the ground. Okay. Timing. <laughs> okay, the, we have just three slides left. The, um, the reason I want to talk to you about, thank you for remembering that. The reason I want to talk to you about Northeast Biodiesel is because it's a mechanism for, um, for generating money for education and community organizing. And that's one of the things that Phil and I have been talking about for a long time. It's like, what kind of businesses will generate revenue for communities to organize themselves and educate themselves? And um, Northeast Biodiesel is one example of a business where you have a profit-making entity that's owned entirely or in part by members or other entities whose top priority is organizing and education. That's what I've decided my formula is. Mm. It's a new theory. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, you want to go to the next one? 
And it, so an example is a nonprofit that has a real estate development company that returns profits um, back to the nonprofit organizing and education programs. That's done a lot. A labor union that provides capital needed for a worker-owned business that uses its share of the profits to support local organizing and education. Or a consumer cooperative like this energy cooperative that uses a portion of their profits for organizing and education programs. Actually, this is a, this is a little bit different variation on that. But yes, please, and this is our last slide. <laughs> a lot of little fish. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. This is really, really good. How was it? Yeah? yeah.